You know, the reason they, they like reading my stuff is that I've always got real life examples to prove what I'm saying. There's a lot of good people that listen to this podcast. You know, other than God and my family, deer hunting would be next in line on my list of priorities. From the bottom of our hearts, it's it's just fantastic and awesome to uh, to have the support that you guys are getting. People ask me about expandable broadheads and love swings. <laughs> Chasing Giants with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Brought to you by Osseo Camo, nature's most lethal camouflage. Follow along as Don and Terry discuss the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Well, Don, we are episode 105 live in Shipshawana, Indiana. No reduce tonight, buddy. Uh, Not at all. We're staring at a bunch of friendly faces. Bunch of friendly faces with a snowstorm outside. We're supposed to get, uh, I don't know, the meteorologist has said multiple things, but a bunch of snow and we still got a bunch of people sitting here uh, supporting us, which is kind of cool. Yeah. I heard uh, anywhere from one to 50 inches. One to 50 inches. It'll settle in somewhere between there. Yeah, I'm sure So uh, we're going to have a bunch of questions. I've already heard some little side conversations getting ready for this tonight about how they're going to put you on the spot and pick on you and stump you and try to get you fired up. There may or may not be a bounty for the first person who does it. We we had to take care of that off air, but um, I think think people are gunning for you tonight. I hope so. Let's... Bring it on. I got Bring some, I, the people listening, I got, I got some comments on my shirt that I had made. This is actually what we were doing during the Super Bowl last week, yeah. is I made me a, a Higgins Delks 22 midterm election shirt. Have you sold any of them? No, I only made one, just for me. Well, I, I get royalties on that, so don't All forget. Right. All right, we'll do that. $5 I talk, royalty per, per shirt. I did, I did text a picture of it to Wes today, and he said his first executive order would be to take gun season out of the rut. And I said, I'd that, be all for that. I too. said, that's probably going to gain you a lot of votes and lose a lot of votes, too. But well, I might eliminate gun season altogether. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, bef- while we're waiting for some questions to come up, I want to circle back on a hot topic that got a little, both of us a little fired up last weekend, and that's humic acid. Um, yep. We took that video. I looked this morning. I think it's over 5,000 views in just a couple days. So a lot of our listeners went out and watched that video, and we still got some people that claim to know it all that told us it was wrong well you know we're never going to be the smartest person out there if you ever think you are just get on the internet and post something and somebody will prove you wrong in about 30 minutes i've claimed to be the best looking person but never yeah. the smartest person well, i wouldn't be right either way <laughs> but i'm gonna say it wouldn't take long to prove but that for one the, wrong <laughs> for the people that missed last week's episode give us give us just a quick overview about you know we introduced that our Expect Healthy Deer Technology products, we started putting humic acid in it at Real World um, early this year. We just announced it in it, but give us the overview of what it's for and what, what the reason behind it. Well, the reason behind it is we came across a study that was done in Michigan, and uh, basically it was showing some real positive results with uh, CWD, this uh, humic acid. Uh, and just to be fair, the research was done on captive deer, but, I mean, it was a scientific study, and we encouraged everybody to watch the video. And, you know, while a lot of states are out there wanting to use sharpshooters and whatever to kill deer when, and, and totally wipe out deer in certain areas where they found CWD, um, I, I personally suspect that maybe the answer is nutrition. Uh, maybe there's a nutrient deficiency and there, there's some research to back that as well. Not only the research we shared, but I found some more this week from uh, the UK, the United Kingdom, um, that was showing certain uh, mineral deficiencies in the soil um, were also uh, kind of related to where they was finding CWD cases. So right. it very well could be that nutrition is the answer um, to solving the CWD problem. So I'm not, um, we, we want to encourage everyone to go listen to the the produced video versus us misrepresent or talk wrong Mm -hmm. about it. The reason we shared the specific video that we did was we felt that it did the best job of kind of explaining what the theory of it is that, that chemicals in some way, shape or forms could lower a pH of a deer's bloodstream. And that when the protein misfolds, the side effects of, 
different neurological diseases or conditions, um, the symptoms is exaggerated. If it's above a certain pH, this video explained that we can mm -hmm. keep the symptoms at bay, not keep the animal from having it altogether. Um, but the, the science and the explanation of that specific video was uh, probably better explained than a lot of the journals and stuff that we found that is hard for people like me to understand. And that video definitely does a better job than I can do. So, uh, like you said, we just encourage people to go watch the video and make up their own mind instead of taking our word for it. The but. interesting fact about the whole thing, you know, we said it, we found it odd that, that that video only had maybe 600 views to it. Right. I had multiple people contact me this week that, like, searched YouTube for the exact title or the exact text that's in the comments of that, and it will not come up in a search engine on there. Surprise, surprise. I mean, uh, the government, it's a political disease just like uh, COVID is. So, uh, Am I not going to get you wound up this early? I'm, not, I'm saving that for somebody's question. Oh, so okay. I hope somebody's coming up with a good one. All right. Well, the big news this weekend, uh, I want to talk about Lester's feet. We got, I, I promised everybody we would have a big announcement that we're going to make this weekend here uh, with the crowd from Shipshawana. But before um, the big news of the weekend is tomorrow night's great debate with Tony LaPratt, we, we're going to do a sound check a little bit later and kind of practice the order of events. But you're going into this thing blind tomorrow, not knowing what the questions are and how this thing's going to go. I have a feeling it's going to be pretty entertaining because I have a feeling that those questions are going to be kind of baited, uh, trying to get me fired up as well. So... Uh I think both of you are getting baited to be fired up, and that's oh, well. what's fun about it. Um, I know the personalities of the people that's putting this event on, and I can guarantee you that you're both getting baited on it. Well, good deal. We'll put on a show for them then. So um, we will have audio and video export of that event. Uh, the the uh, promoters of this event actually hold the rights to that, so at some point in time they'll release to uh, the people that aren't in attendance for the weekend how they can watch that and, uh, and enjoy it also. Um, you got anything else to talk about? You I'm went ready. You went consulting in, uh, in Michigan this, this week, I didn't did, you? I did, and you know what? You know, I, I hammered the, the NFL on Super Bowl Sunday in a social media post, and I got blasted a little bit for, from that. I actually had to – I think I had to ban three people from my page for <laughs> stupid comments. But uh, And then of all things that, that happened this week, I'm on an NFL player's property <laughs> – doing a consulting did he business. hear you did he hear what the comments you made uh, he, he didn't say anything and i didn't either because he's a lot bigger than i am so <laughs> i, can guarantee I, I you kept that. my pie hole shut on that one <laughs> but in many cases when we've when we've kind of criticized uh that type of outlet it's not as much a, there's a bunch of really good players Absolutely. and people um you know, you've done consulting on Major League Baseball players' properties and, and, and different celebrity-type folk. Um, there's, a, there's a ton of really good people that use their platform like we're trying to do. You know, we're at a much smaller scale, but there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that try to do good. Um, it's when the organization itself can't stand for anything credible or halfway sane that, that they get called the toilet bowl at that point. Well, I think some of those organizations are trying to cater to a, a certain audience and, uh, you know, so they'll jump on the the hot topic of the week or, or whatever to uh, appease a certain group. And uh, like you said, there's a lot of those players that use their platforms for great things. You know, a lot of them have nonprofit foundations where they're helping kids just like we are with Lester's Feet and a lot of other good worthy causes as well. So, you know, we can't... Uh, throw them all under the bus but uh, the NFL as an organization has done some pretty disgusting things and made some pretty terrible stands in my opinion on some topics but that's why I spent the time making this beautiful shirt you think I have any chance of getting elected no I don't need <laughs> <laughs> well not, um, not a prayer you know, we, we talk openly about our friends at Matthews who uh, support the, the podcast and the channel and have been a longtime uh, business partner of ours for many, many years. Um, but normally in a time of a podcast, we take an opportunity to talk about a specific family and uh, showcase that video on there. But um, I'm going to talk about a specific family that has a really cool story with no video today. Um, you know, we've said time after time that God just keeps opening doors and, you know, whether it was 
when we went down to Guthrie and got caught in that tornado and uh, Austin, one of the board members and I were in a hotel, the roof got ripped off and ended up, he went back down the next day and blindly went to a very close personal friend of ours or um, just a couple weeks ago, we went to um, Huntington, West Virginia and a couple days before found a family local that, that needed help. Um, this, guys, this thing got, this great debate got talked about a year ago. And, right. and, the, and the promoters came to your booth and picked, pitched the idea. You said yes. They went over, and I don't know if they talked to Tony first or you first, but regardless, they did it in just a couple-minute window. And the plan at that point in time was let's get everybody together, have a lot of fun, and raise some money for charity. And that's all it was talked about. As this thing navigated and, and kept moving forward, um, you know, you, you got to pick a charity that you wanted to put the money that was raised at this weekend at this event, and you chose Lester's Feet. Um, this week, help me out, Austin, was it went Tuesday night, Wednesday night? We found out about a widow that lives less than 40 minutes from where we're sitting right now. Her husband passed away. He was a UPS driver, and he had an autoimmune disease and developed cancer in his lungs and passed away in 2020. So we have a widow that's a mother of three. Their little seven-year-old boy was playing in a barn and got a mold spore, coughing a lot, and they went and started doing tests and found out that he has the same autoimmune disease that killed his father. So in just a matter of two weeks, they're taking that little seven-year-old boy, and he has to go through 10 rounds of chemo and a bone marrow transplant and won't get out of the hospital till late May. But because his condition is um, respiratory, their house has to be completely gutted of all carpet and everything else and go with solid uh, surface flooring because of the dust, keeping the dust down and some HVAC work. So how cool is it that every dollar that when you come to the Lester's Feet booth and buy a t-shirt or you make a donation or buying a ticket to tomorrow, that that money that's raised through Lester's Feet is going to stay in this community to a widow with three kids that needs help. And that's nothing but God just connecting dots for a family and all of these people coming to, who cares if you're ranting about mm -hmm. politics? It's, it's just God opening a door for us to do something good with a, with a lot of people. His timing is perfect, and uh, that, that's just another perfect example of it. So, um, you know, the, the, the other thing I'm going to ask is a favor both tonight and tomorrow night. Um, we have, we'll have our entire board of directors here uh, from the foundation. If you come to the booth, there is some small cards with the Lester's Feet logo on them. What I'm going to ask is you guys take those home with you and do one of two things. Either have the kids color pictures on the back or the adults can write little handwritten notes of encouragement and mail those to us. And when we find one of these families that we're helping that's in the hospital, we're going to send your card to those kids or those mothers that are sitting there with a sick kid so that they can see all of these people. They can't see all of you all here tonight and tomorrow night raising money, but we can, we can extend a note of encouragement. So these cards are in the booth. Come get them. Pick up a card with the address. Take them to your school. Take them to your church and let the kids color on them. I think it'll be an awesome way to show them the support and number of people behind it. Um, as far as an update on a raffle, I really wanted to be able to sell tickets at the show today, but I knew I was going to miss it by about two weeks. We, we did get our permit. Uh, we will be able to start selling tickets around March 1st. So there'll be a way that you can mail in tickets and you can buy online. Um, we've talked about Chris Yates and Brian Kraft donating a new truck. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a 30 by 40 material kit for a post frame building donated. We got a couple of hunting blinds. And a John Deere tractor. And this week we got word that there will be a brand new John Deere 1025R with a loader that's donated. Um, so as of right now, our prize package uh, is up over $125,000 and still growing. I've been actually approached by two other vendors at the show today. Awesome. Wanting to donate. So, um, and, and, oh, yesterday I got a phone call. Some, a, a person listening to this podcast, I believe from Vermont, is donating a gallon of maple syrup. Awesome. We'll have I prizes. Like, I like maple syrup. Prizes for everybody. So uh, we'll, we'll keep announcing what's going on, but I just want you guys to know 
I wish we were smart enough to plan this from the beginning. We're, we really didn't. It's just uh, it's a matter of God using a bunch of people to do something good. And the community at Ship Shawana was really one of the first communities that encouraged us to do this and do more and supported it. And uh, I can only think it's fitting that we come back here this year mm-hmm. and raise money for a local family. I just, I think that's so cool. Well, anytime I show up in this community, it's like they roll out the red carpet for me. I've got so many friends that uh, are in this area. It's it's like a home away from home and just really appreciate all the support for me personally, but also for Lester's feet. All right. Well, I don't have anything else, and we need questions. we got one person coming up, so he's going to come up to a microphone, and you, you're able, if you want to say your name and where you're from, that's fine. If not, just ask your question. Good evening, everyone. It's Eli Beachy. I'm from Hopkinton, Iowa. Uh, it's, first of all, I want to thank you all for what you're doing for the Lester's Feed Foundation. I think it's great. i got three questions. The first is, I was curious, Don, if you think there's a difference year after year in the deer's antler strength. Like this year, I think I saw more busted antlers while hunting than any other year. I was curious what your thought is on that. I, I do think there is, and I think in wetter years um, – the, the antlers are weaker. Um, I, I don't know if you experienced the, the wet year that we had. I did not notice a lot of bucks in my area that with broken racks this year. But I know back when I had my captive deer, it would seem like, and, and their diet was, you know, largely grain or a, a feed that I was giving them. But also, I tried to have my captive deer when I had them always in, in pens where they had clover, alfalfa, things like that as well. And I don't know if there's something about the nutrient content in those plants. Uh, I'm sure there is. In, in a wet year, you know, it's more, it's not as nutrient dense, a little more watered down. I know there's also been some research, uh, a friend of mine, um, that is that the uh, project manager at, on the Lake Shelbyville project in Illinois, Lee Mitchell, um, he's a wildlife biologist there. And in 2012, when we had the drought, um, the antler quality, I, I, it was down significantly, as were body weights on bucks of all ages. So I think weather does play some role. Okay, thank you for that. And then my second question is, if, you'd have, if you have a 17-acre field with no trees or any no woods around it, the closest woods is probably, I'm going to say, at least a half a mile, and that's not a big one. And to the three sides of it, there's got to be at least a mile before the first woods. What would your first option be in a 17-acre field to try to hold some deer? Well, you definitely got to create cover. Um, it, it depends on how old you are because if uh, you're an old guy like me, you want to do it in a hurry. And that's where the native grasses and miscanthus comes in. Um, if you're you know, in your 20s or 30s, I'd be planting trees and shrubs on that uh, 17 acres. So I guess it kind of varies by, you know, how fast you, you need that cover to be there. I, I think in the end, the trees and shrubs are going to make you the better cover. But if you don't have 10, 15 years to wait on it, um, go, with the, go with the switchgrass and use a miscanthus within that switchgrass for some structure. I got a follow-up question on that one because I think that's fantastic. That's, that question is almost worth an article before you go to your third one. Does the temperature or where you're at in the country, north to south, mm-hmm. change that opinion? And does topography change that opinion? So if it's dead flat, does it lead, to, uh, lead us more to native grass or trees cover? And then weather, how cold it gets? Well, I, I think the region north to south definitely would play into it. And the farther north you go, I think the, the bigger the advantage the trees and shrubs play, uh, especially if you can add some conifers in there. Um, if it's wide open all around, you're probably going to be able to get away with planting white pines or something like that. Where if there's a, if you're in an area with the, already has an established deer population, you're probably not going to get away with that. They're going to eat them and destroy them. Red cedars would be another option, but uh, yeah, th- that definitely plays into it. Um, the the rolling or, or flat terrain, uh, rolling terrain le- lends more towards the grasses as well. I've had uh, really good luck on my own farm on the, the rougher terrain that we've got, putting those native grasses and getting the deer to bed on them. The, the bucks especially like to bed just just right off of the crest of a little rise, 
and uh, on the downwind side. And, and I can tell you on my farm where the biggest buck, every year the biggest buck that's there, he's going to bed in the same spot. And if that buck gets killed, guess what? The, the next biggest buck, he's taking over that spot. And, and it's in a rolling native grass field. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. And then my third question is, <clears throat> I feel your sympathy for donating to a Biden supporter with your clothes and your gun down there and you were at the Leaf of Missouri. Yeah. Because I just got $3,000 worth of stuff taken from myself. But that's not my question. And my question is, what are we going to do with this, this COVID vaccine thing if it keeps going on like this and we won't be able to do anything? My question is, why don't you run for president? I think you could do it. <laughs> Well, I don't think I could win dog catcher in my own hometown, to be honest with you. <laughs> but uh, I definitely think we'd have a good one to take care of the COVID vaccine deal. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, if I was president for about a week, we'd be living in a different country and we wouldn't have a COVID vaccine, period. <laughs> we also wouldn't have a Dr. Fauci. He'd be sitting in the bottom of the ocean. Sharks would be <laughs> chewing on that guy. <laughs> There's one reason why Don's never going to be in politics is he can't be bought. <laughs> Everybody yeah. else, er, hey, I've seen this guy over the last 16 <laughs> years lose more money in the outdoor industry than he's made because he's not going to be bought. And, and that's, not a, that's, that's not a dig to him. That's, that's the honest truth. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he'll, he'll say he's, <laughs> he's very blessed, but I've seen him lose more money in the outdoor industry than gain because he won't cave to the pressure of telling what people think he needs to say. There's no doubt about that. So this will probably be the only shirt that ever gets made with this on it. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe maybe you should auction that shirt off here today. We could. Hey, we can do that. Raise the money for Lester's feet. All right. We need another question. Here we go. My name is Larry Beachy. I'm from Millersburg, Indiana. And my question is that uh, at what stage – and how many years were you managing your wild deer population before you started before you started the process of culling younger bucks that you didn't see had the potential to grow into world class whitetails as five and a half or six and a half year old bucks? That's a great question. That is a good question, and I'm gonna have to think about You're that. You're gonna a have bit. to make a timeline out here on the table. All right. It's um so I've been managing my property for, for whitetails for about um, right at 30 years now. And I, I probably, I'm going to say I really started culling hard about 10 years ago. So, but, and, and you know, ironically, it's, it's only been in the last um, six or so years Actually, what happened in 2012, my farm got hit with EHD. Yeah, and that's, w- that's a big factor in this whole conversation. Yep, and wiped out a, a large portion of the deer herd in my area, like 75% plus. And when that deer herd came back, it was almost like it, it came back with better genetics than what it had before. And in, in 17, I, I shot uh, Smokey on my farm at 206 and then in 20 I shot Mel um, at 221 and those kind of deer were not around before 2012 and actually nothing close in fact before 2012 to my knowledge there was never a deer on that farm that would have scored more than about 100 in low 170s Um, yeah in fact I killed two that were like one was 171, the other 172 on that farm um, before 2012. And those were the biggest deer that I'd ever seen on that farm. But when, when EHD hit and, and the deer slowly came back, I, I don't know if the EHD wiped out the bad genetics or what. It didn't all of them for sure, but, but it was almost like a, a different genetic strain or whatever was there. Thank you for that. I also have another question. It's kind of politics related. Okay, I was was uh, kind of expecting that. (laughs) My question is, how long, we actually own a captive deer herd ourselves, and uh, my question is, how long with this uh, humic acid thing coming out, how long do you think it's going to take politics to realize how wrong they were about the EHD, or not the EHD, the CWD slash deer COVID, 
<laughs> How long is it going to take them to realize that they were wrong all along and that what they're doing is not making any difference? Well, well I guess I, I need to ask you a question. You, are you saying that? How long is it going to take them to realize they were wrong, or how long is it going to take them to admit they were wrong? <laughs> because they're never going to admit they're wrong, and they probably already know they're wrong. It's going to take yeah. new politicians is all that's going to be. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, while we're waiting on the next question to come up, there's, there's one thing that we need to talk about, and if we don't have time to do it here, yeah. maybe we need to make it a topic on a podcast and that is um, how many bucks are really shot on your farm every year? More than people would think. People don't realize that. <laughs> and even going back pre-Smokey, um, there, there's been bucks shot on your place every year. I don't think people oh, get yeah. a perspective of that. So maybe we need to make a mental note of that, and you might have to do some math to, to get an accurate number, but I think that would be a really interesting topic. So um, just wait one second. He's going to pan over yeah, we got a question. Oh, great. I yeah. didn't really want to do this. I'm trying to help. Oh, uh, come out. on. I appreciate it. <laughs> the first few are always the worst. You guys are both my mentors. Um, I wanted to ask Don, I know you're an advocate of large food plots. Mm -hmm. I'd kind of like to know why. If, if you're building a deer herd or trying to build one, would you be better off on having malt, not talking about malt micro food plots, but like say one acre food plots if you've got the space? to separate the does to build a deer herd? Well, I think a good argument could be made for that case, but when I'm setting up a property, you know, one step, one step is you gotta grow the bucks that you're trying, you wanna kill. If you wanna kill four-year-old bucks, you gotta grow four-year-old bucks. If you wanna kill six-year-olds, you gotta grow six-year-olds. Sure. But the, the second thing that I'm trying to do when I set up a property is, is I'm trying to set it up in such a way that once you get the buck there that you want to kill, whether he's a four-year-old, six-year-old, whatever, he needs to be moving in such a way that makes him vulnerable to hunting pressure on that property so you can, you can get him killed. And, and if he stands up from his bed in the afternoon and he's got six different options where he can go to different six different food plots, he's going to be a whole lot tougher to kill than if he's got two options, only two food plots. And the other thing is you probably heard me um, compare food plots to restaurants for people. Yes, sir. So a small food plot is like a fast food restaurant. If you're driving by McDonald's and you're hungry, you may pull over to McDonald's and eat. But you're not going to take your wife out on Saturday night and drive 50 miles to McDonald's. McDonald's does not have pulling power. A small food plot does not have pulling power. If a deer is hungry and he's walking by that small plot, yeah, he may stop and eat, but you're not going to pull him from a quarter mile away to that small plot. How hey, big are you talking? I, I like for food plots to be measured in acres. Right. And uh, it, it depends on the property, but, you know, if ideally if you had 200 acres to work with, I'd like to see some, a couple of food plots that are 10 acres each. Oh, wow. Oh, and wow. maybe broken up with different crops within that plot. Sure. But it's almost, instead of like a plot, it's almost like a feeding area. So, and, you know, another thing while we're on the topic is people want, want to plant fruit, mass-bearing trees on their farm. I, I don't want those scattered all over the place. I want them right around the edge of that plot. So yeah. you're, you're creating, instead of your McDonald's, you've got a five-star, all-you-can-eat, seven-meat buffet. And you're, you're pulling deer from your sanctuary, your bedding area, but you're also pulling your neighbor's deer. And it just has a whole lot more pulling power the bigger it is. I mean, we see deer all the time feeding out in ag fields, and you might have a food plot right there 100 yards away those deer could be feeding in, but instead they like that big open ag field. Well, the reason why I ask that question, I've sat on food plots, and I'll notice the does, they'll come in like you'll have a, a series of, they'll be the youngest does, and then, mm -hmm. the, then the older does, and the bucks are the last. Mm -hmm. You know, and it would seem like if you could spread those does out, that it, there wouldn't be less competition. I guess if you have a 10 acre food plot though, they can spread themselves out along the side of the food plot. And that's yeah, that, that's yeah. right. And you know, a, a good argument could be made the other way um, for the case you're trying to make by scattering out those different doe family groups. But you know, from what I've seen, they'll work out that, that pecking order, uh, that dominance, and uh, they'll just take turns and they'll all feed in the same plot. 
Thank you, sir. There's, yeah, thank you. There's a couple other things I think fall in line with that, that question is the smaller these food plots are, those are the people that have to worry about browse a whole lot more. Mm-hmm. Okay, so when we, when we start choosing, and, and, and in some cases, people don't have the land. They don't have the real estate to right. do what we're talking about. And if that's the case, it doesn't mean you're dead. Don't try to do anything. But I think that's where diversity and choosing products that hold up to browse. That's why we don't sell soybean bags of a half acre. There's no way possible that you could ever get that to survive. Um, the second thing I'll say is what he just said about a deer standing up and, and being vulnerable during daylight hours. If there's one thing that I think you ask and you polled the people that come to the master class, what they really got out of the event that they don't hear on his podcast or his videos or anything else, it's the creative ways to say, here's bedding, here's food. How can I be in between it with the wind that needs to be the wind and an access from the truck or the road to set up those things to align to where I have a crack at him? How many times has everybody in this room looked out in a field and seen a monster buck out in the middle of the field? Most of the time that buck's not killable unless you're shooting something with long range, right? The one thing that he does really, really helpful to land managers is try to connect those dots and visually seeing that starts making a whole lot more sense to what your question was. All right. All right, we got another question. Step up to the mic. Hello, I'm Damon Marling from Paris Cross, Indiana. Um, last podcast, I heard you talk about a fellow said that he had his property logged and uh, he was wondering if he should cut some trails through it. And uh, first Don said, no, get it, just leave it alone and let the deer be. And then Terry kind of corrected him a little bit and said, I, I think we did move some things around on your property, Don, and, and made it so the deer could come through certain areas. Well, my question to you is, how far do you go with that? Because there's another fellow that talks about creating like spokes on a wheel and creates paths through that jungle to where they would want to come into one area so you would be downwind and be able to shoot them in that area. And I was wondering about that, if you you would agree with that or just minimal – uh, what you said last time or whatever. My head's a little bigger because I corrected you. Yeah, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to prove you wrong. <laughs> as far as, as the deer bedding cover, um, you don't need to do anything. Just let that stuff fall. That, now, what Terry brought up was that I did go in with a skid loader and, and I pushed some things to the side to bring those deer past my tree stand. I did that for huntability, not for better cover or any reason like that. And it was only a few yards into the where it was cut. It wasn't all the way through it. It just to get them to go over closer within bow range. In, in regards to the spokes on the wheel, I have no idea who gave you that idea, but I can tell you that I was on a property in, in not far from here a couple of years ago where another uh, consultant had come in and put together a plan, and, and we was down in this thick, thick river bottom not far off the river and uh, there was a lot of saplings down there um, soft maple silver maple saplings and they had cut or th- this other consultant had, had advised that they cut these spokes of a wheel and right in the middle of it is this b- elevated blind well my question is what wind direction do you hunt it and, and where's your access because there was absolutely no wind direction that could have possibly been correct and and a mature buck is going to use the wind he's coming into a spot like that he's coming in with the wind at his advantage he's going to smell you any every time and i I think that when it comes to consultants and tony and i may get into this tomorrow night some but i i see it as there's there's really two different groups there's a group that will help you see and and kill more deer And, and then there's my group that's going to help you kill the biggest bucks you possibly can. And if you're killing the biggest bucks you possibly can, you're also going to kill more and more deer if you want to, if that's your goal. But, um, you know, anybody that you hire as a consultant should be able to help you see and kill more deer. But it's the bigger, older bucks that, that's the real challenge. And there's things that you can get away with 
with those does and younger bucks that you're absolutely not going to get away with with the older bucks. And one of those is that spokes on a wheel thing. And, and I mean, I stood right there where it, where it was designed and where it was developed, and, and there was no way that I would have hunted there because uh, you just wasn't going to kill a mature buck there. Okay, my next question. Um, I don't know if you've noticed or not or, or where you are, but where I'm located, um, the Bradford pears have been coming up in my fence rows and along the edge of woods, mm -hmm. and I know that that's an ornamental tree that's started in people's houses for the beautifulness of it or whatever. Um, are those a problem that we need to look out for, that we need to start cutting, or, or is that something good that animals would like? Uh, well, it, it's a calorie pear. A calorie pear includes Cleveland pears, Bradford pears, the ornamental pears. Yeah. Um, they are in some areas, I, I know especially you get into some more southern states like Kentucky and Tennessee, that they're becoming a real issue there. They're invasive, and, and they're choking out some of the native vegetation. I, I don't see – they have the little berries on them. I, I'm sure the birds eat them, and I'm sure that's how they get spread. But other than feeding the birds, I, I don't see anything positive out of them. Um, other than the fact that, you know what, you can, if you find young ones, you can take a, and graft a pear tree onto that root system. I have one off my back porch, and the deer eat the bird seed that's hanging from it, but I've never really seen them hit it. Okay. Good uh, question, though. Third question. This must be the stumper. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can tell uh, We've established th that uh, you like to cater to the rich, I think. Well, and uh, so yeah. I was wondering how much money you need to make until you finally come around to help the poor people. Well, I'll tell you what. I haven't figured that out yet, but as soon as I make that, that amount, I'll, I'll let you know. We're still waiting on the people to help us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Emotionally, not financially. Yeah. We need that's all the help. I, that's where I need most of my help. We need all the help we can get, don't we? All right. Hi, I'm Alex Burrow from Arcadia, Indiana. Uh, kind of a follow-up on the cleaning up, but more on the food plots. Will a large buck avoid a food plot with unnatural logs piled on the edges, or do you want to clear those back away so the edges can be more feathered? Well, I think every buck's different. Uh, they all have got different personalities, and... Um, I think you can close them in too much. I mean, if you're if you got a plot the size of this room and, and you got a wall around it, yeah, there's most bucks are mature, most mature bucks are not going to come in there and and block himself in. Um, you know, on the other hand, if it's a bigger plot, maybe it's only got logs piled up on two or three sides. I think he's a lot more likely to. But again, it goes it goes down to personality. I don't think that most hunters appreciate how different one mature buck is from another. I mean, they're all different. If you, out there in, uh, in, in my booth, I've got my three 200-inch bucks that I've shot. The one buck on, on the far right is Smokey. That, that's the easiest buck I've ever hunted in my life. I mean, don't let the big antlers fool you. Because he had big antlers didn't mean he was smarter. I, I mean, I knew I was going to kill that deer, and I did it on the second hunt for him. I, I seen him on the first hunt. I even knew where I was going to do it. Um, you, told the, knew, you told the owner of the 360 blinds, he said, I'm yeah. going to kill a 200-inch deer out of that spot. Yeah, he told me if I did, that he, he kind of <laughs> laughed. He says, yeah, you kill a 200-inch buck there this season, and I'll give you a free blind. Well, he gave me a free <laughs> blind because I killed him there. Um, it doesn't happen like that very often, but I knew that buck's personality. That buck was a homebody. He never left, and it didn't matter, and that's very rare. Uh, for the bucks that have been on my farm. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think of, uh, there was ever another buck that was as much a homebody as Smokey was. And, but that's just one example of how their personalities change. I've got bucks on my farm and I've had bucks on my farm that they always wanted to bed in the tall grass fields. They just loved the grasses. And I had others that almost never bedded in the grasses. They always wanted to bed in the wooded cover. So when it comes to a question like that, you know, we can make generalities, but we, we can't say you know, a, a buck is never going to come into a plot with, that's got, you know, logs piled up around it. It's just most of the time they're not. 
um, but occasionally you might get one that does. I think the I think the more basic answer to that is miscanthus or logs or pushing brush up is a great tool to use to give you access to a spot, block vantage point from a road, or maybe make a deer go, instead of being 60 yards, come out at 30 yards. But I would caution you on basically making a perimeter where it feels like they're in a concrete block basement, if that makes sense. Right. But all of those tools that you asked your question about can be vital tools to setting up where you hunt, how you get in, and, and creating that pinch where he's within that 30-yard window. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. All right. Got another one coming. Got another one coming. This is going to be a brain buster, I bet. I'm Mark from Southwest Michigan. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts already. Love them. Thank you. I really like them when you get all fired up. That's my well. favorite part. <laughs> See what you can do here. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> one of the properties I hunt is bisected by a creek. And it's one of those that when you step in, you go down to your hips in the muck. And there's only a couple spots where the deer cross. Would you recommend building a bridge so they can cross? It's like in the woods. Uh, absolutely. Anything you can do to funnel deer movement, you, you should do it. I, I mean, I sit in my stands every, every season, and, and I take notes as I'm sitting there, you know, just passing time. I'm taking notes. What can I do to make this stand better than it is today? Um, sometimes it's cutting another shooting lane. Sometimes it's maybe dropping a tree that's on a trail just a little bit further than what I can shoot to push the deer up closer, whatever. Things like what you're, you're talking about, building a bridge through a swamp, um, absolutely will funnel deer right past your stand. Why don't, you, why don't you talk about your idea that you gave me about my lease, where it's multi-floor rows and there's trails going everywhere to connect those two plots that you talked about with that culvert. Oh, yeah. That's the perfect example, I think, of what he's talking yeah. about. Um, I, I've seen it firsthand where deer will go... 150 yards or more out of their way to cross a creek where there's a bridge or a crossing. Uh, Just putting a culvert in and and um, when they can walk straight across instead of up and down the bank, they'll go out of their way to do that. No different than you and I. Um, So anytime you can create something like that, you can really concentrate and funnel a lot of deer movement and gives you a great place for a stand. Gotcha, yep. My second question, Um, we're logging our woods. And what would be your choice of a tree to plant in the open areas? Well, oaks are my favorite, hands down. It's, uh, is it a lowland or upland? It's sort of lowland. It doesn't flood. But it's, it's fairly wet. It's pretty wet. rich soil. I, I, would, I would go with swamp white oaks heavily. Um, the majority of the planting would be swamp white oaks. Um, what I love about them is they hold their leaves really late in the fall. So, um, you know, you still got cover into December and even January sometimes with, with uh, specific trees. So swamp white oaks would definitely be my favorite. You could also put some pin oaks in there. They would do well in, in a site like that. Um, those would be my two favorites. Burr oaks would do well there too. But um, they lose their leaves and you know fairly early in the fall, and then that would be my third choice. What I do like about the burr oaks is they produce a nice big acorn that the deer really like. But the swamp white will produce acorns quicker. I had a tree nursery where I grew these trees and, and would dig them up for, uh, you know, ball and burlap them for shade and landscape trees. And it was not rare at all to have uh, swamp white oaks that were only like five years old dropping acorns way quicker than the burr oaks or pin oaks or anything else. So swamp white oak would definitely be my number one choice. Thank you, yeah. Um, I don't want to, to take too much of your time, but... We don't, don't, we don't charge by the question. I don't That's have okay. access to, you know, the things that yeah. some people have to submit questions to the podcast, so I got like... Yeah. I could take the whole night. <laughs> Keep firing away. But anyway, my third question is, have you thought about a way for us as Amish to submit questions to the podcast? Yes. I know your phones are overloaded, but... Um, I think, um, I don't know that it's going to be, it it might take us a couple months, but we actually, or I actually started working on a fax number, the digital fax, where you guys could still send in and 
it would be treated just like a question that would come in via email. Gotcha. But without it, I think it at least has, I haven't figured out a way that to do it without it being a fax. Um, if you have another idea, I'd be willing to stop by the booth and we can talk about it more. But I think that's probably going to be the best way to do it. I, there's ways that you can fax to a number that comes into us as an email. And I think that's probably going to end up being the way that we implement that in because you guys are such a vital part to our audience. We want you to participate in this just as much. So, um, One last one. Um, oh, no, it slipped my mind. Must have been about politics in him. <laughs> yes, he does like Nancy. I was going to ask you about something like that, but <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd just better leave it for someone else. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, there, there's still a, a free prize on the line for the first yeah, nobody Yeah, nobody up. wants the free prize. That's amazing. Well, I, I think I'll leave it, and uh, I'll let someone else take it up. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. Somebody's got to be wanting to take a I don't no. think anybody else has a question. Nobody else has. All these people in here, you got people looking uh, at each other. Here we go. Oh, we got the repeat offender here. He's coming <laughs> back for more. <laughs> this is Alex again. Um, so I hunt like central Indiana, patchwoods, and ag country, and then southern Indiana, more big timber. Um, central Indiana, you kind of, there's a, a mature buck using that patchwoods not more predictable but there's not a lot of other options around can you do you think you can take that and transfer it to like a specific ridge in a big woods where a big buck tends to be that spot and you can pattern him i don't want to say as easy but as easy as a patch woods yeah i mean they'll uh, be that they'll, they'll hone in on an area like that mm -hmm. and it starts with freedom of human intrusion Th those bucks are going to find those little places out of the way that are over sometimes they're not even out of the way just overlooked places where, where humans av avoid for whatever reason maybe it's so obvious maybe it's right along the road um people park you know at one spot and they, they just walk past the, this place that's right next to the parking lot next to the road uh, a big if it's thick that that's number two first it's got to be free of human intrusion second if it's thick that really helps too um so those would be the two keys all right thanks I'm, I'm going to make an overgeneralized comment here, and it's it, you just your question got me thinking a little bit. I think I think the the common excuse for anything is what really prevails in that. And, and you mentioned different types of hunting scenarios, and you always have the guys that say, "Oh, well, if I could hunt in Illinois every year, I'd have a wall full of booners." Or if I hunted here, I, I think that. The stigmatism of big woods and rolling terrain versus open ag, uh, there are some differences in technique and how you find deer, how you hunt deer. But I think the people that are just saying, I can't kill big deer because I'm in more wooded cover, it's just an excuse. It, it, it's, it's a lack of focus of understanding what a mature buck is doing. A mature buck is using that terrain just the same as a small little swell that you would have an open ag field. Um, I think when you really separate it down, the lessons that you learn about what a mature bucks is doing is going to be consistent no matter where you're at. The difference is going to be some areas can't produce a 200-inch buck. Let's just face it, right? Yeah. But a, a six-year-old buck in Georgia is just as hard of a six-year-old buck to kill in, in Illinois. Well, I do think that, that ag country – woodlots and such as you got in central Indiana. It's what I hunt in central Illinois. I, I do think that's easier to hunt. But at the same time, 99% of deer hunters hunting that type of area never kill a single booner in their life if they live to 80. So the guys that are going to figure it out are going to figure it out. And a perfect example of that is Bobby Worthington. And I don't know if you ever read any Bobby Worthington's articles in North American Whitetail. He's been writing a long time. If I ever had to was ever forced to name who I think is the number one best deer hunter in, in the world, it would be Bobby Worthington. That guy lives in East Tennessee, a place where there are no giants, and on a consistent basis, he finds them and kills them in the mountains. <laughs> if he can, and he's, he's also done it on out-of-state hunts. He killed one in, in southern Illinois on public land, an absolute giant um, that was featured in North American Whitetail. 
the the guys that are going to do it are going to do it no matter where they are. If they're in heavily wooded, they, they happen to live in a mountainous, heavily wooded area, they're going to find a way to do it there. If they live in farm country, they're going to find a way to do it there. Just so, because uh, it's heavily wooded area doesn't mean a gimmick's going to work. <laughs> that's it's, true. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's a great question. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. All right. This young man wants to win a free prize. He's going to stump us, Terry. So if, uh, so if Nancy Pelosi would be a deer hunter, <laughs> would, who would she recommend to, like, for make her land good for deer hunting? Who would, what, what consultant would she hire? You or Tony LaPrade. <laughs> <laughs> I would let Tony have that one. <laughs> you would you would forfeit your income on that consulting visit to let that, somebody that, else do that it. Lady does not. No, let's send me. Wes. T- Tony can have it. <laughs> that sounds like a job for Wes Ducks. I, I bet Tony would turn her down too, though. I bet he would too. Why don't you go out there and ask Tony what he would do if Nancy called him? <laughs> <laughs> You come by, you're going to get a free prize anyway just because you was the one that had the guts to ask that question. (laughs) (laughs) Osseo Gear introduces a premium line of bow hunting gear that is unmatched, pairing nature's finest camouflage with the best technological innovations. Osseo Gear brings whitetail bow hunters the gear they need to be the best at their craft. The unique camouflage mimics the intricate feather pattern of North America's greatest predatorial creatures. Designed for invisibility, built for comfort, and engineered for function. Visit osseogear.com. That's A-S-I-O gear.com to start shopping. Osseo Gear, prepare to be invisible. How do you how do you keep uh, neighbors' dogs off your property the polite way? <laughs> they provide access. <laughs> they provide access to us. So okay, we're gonna access, kill so. all the cameras and anything. Everybody, put their phones away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Wow. <laughs> there, there is no nice way. Put it that way. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I've tried it every way. And it, it, there's, there's no nice way. You go knock on the neighbor's door, and guess what? First time, you don't even have to do anything. That dog comes up missing, and it's your fault. Um, but there's just. Whether you do anything or not. Yeah, you, you, you can play in one time, and that dog could be picked up, hit, whatever, and it's going to be your fault. What do mature bucks think about dogs? That's the worst thing on a property. It's worse than human intrusion. It's the only thing worse than human intrusion is a dog. You ask anybody that, that's raised captive deer, and I know there's some guys here that have raised captive deer, just to ask them what a dog does. And I've and I seen it with my own captive deer back when I had them. A coyote could walk across the field, and those deer would just stand there in the pen. They'd look at that coyote, and they'd flare their tail a little bit or whatever as that coyote walked across. Then they'd go right back to feeding or whatever. You put a dog walking across the same distance away, I don't care if it's a little chihuahua the size of this cup. <laughs> those, those deer are going nuts. They're bouncing off the fence. They hate dogs. And when a dog runs through the woods, he can smell those deer. He's rousting them out. The very, very worst thing on a property is dogs. There's nothing worse. No good deed goes unpunished. Just one more question. Would you rather promote... Would you rather promote uh, Mc- or uh, mechanical blades, or vote for Bi- re-elect Biden. <laughs> Move to Canada. <laughs> is that my only two choices? <laughs> now, what is it? I got to promote mechanical broadheads, or vote to re-elect Biden? Well, I never voted for Biden in the first place. So <laughs> never used a mechanical um, broadhead either. Yeah, because I'm smarter than that. But um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure how to answer that one because. Uh, well, yeah. my my country means more to me than oh, it does most people. I mean, nowhere else on this planet could I have been born and do what I do today. I've been 
extremely blessed, and it's because of this country. Uh, the blessings come from God, but, you know, the fact that he put me in this country was a blessing. I, I could have been born to a family and who knows where. Um, so th- th- there's no way I'm voting for an idiot like Joe Biden. Um, the mechanical head thing comes down to basically ethics. Um, I think we owe it to the animal to to kill them as quickly and as humanely as possible. There, there's absolutely nothing wrong with us hunting and shooting animals, but when we do, we need to do everything in our power to see to it that that animal does not suffer. And in my opinion, and I know there's going to be people that believe just as strongly the opposite, but in my opinion, a, a broadhead is just, it's not a matter of if it fails, it's, it's a matter of when it fails. A, a mechanical broadhead is going to fail. And I don't care who out here is using them. Mark my words and remember the day Don told you this, you're going to lose a buck one day, and it's probably going to be the biggest buck of your life, and you're going to wish that you didn't have a mechanical on the end of that, bro- the end of that arrow. So I, I don't know. I might have to just give up hunting if I had to do that. So I don't know. E- ethics means a lot to me, but this country means a, a whole lot more to me. So it, it'd be a He would choice. probably give up hunting before he would do that, honestly. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. He would he would start back modeling. If you didn't know, Don had a modeling career before he started uh, yeah. deer hunting. I, I was a foot model. Just ask my <laughs> wife. <laughs> She's shaking her head. Yeah, no. she said no. Don't ask her. <laughs> you don't want to know the answer. All right, we got time for just a couple more, so you better make your way up here. We're going to run out of time. Here comes the infamous Eddie Ray. Eddie raises a captive deer. He can tell you all about what deer think about dogs. What What do dogs think about Fred? This might be a stupid question, but this is for you, Don. Do you feel there's an advantage to hunt in a slight breeze rather than no wind and very quiet? That there is an advantage to having a wind. I mean, I, I don't want a dead, calm day. And for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's nothing there to cover your sound. Um, if you've got the leaves blowing and such, you can get away with a whole lot more, both from sound and the movement of branches and things like that. Um, the other thing is what it does, a calm day does to your scent. It just kind of falls to the ground and it just goes every different direction. And with a steady breeze, you can control where your scent's going, or at least know where it's going. There's another answer to that. What's that? You're relying on the buck to use that wind because you're understanding what that buck's doing. Yep, good point. A mature buck's using that wind the same way you're wanting to use it for the opposite reason. Yep. So another question, and I know this depends on how you're set up, but is there a certain wind direction that's your favorite direction to hunt? Absolutely. East. East wind. Yep. And we don't get a lot of east wind, but when we get an east wind, it comes with a weather front every time. And I, I've had some of my best hunts on an east wind, um, especially early November, that first week of November. Uh, you get an east wind, it comes with a cold front. A lot of times it's a, a rain has come in with it, and the bucks are on their feet moving. Some of my best stands are east wind stands. And uh, I just, I, I don't hardly miss a hunt when the wind's out of the east. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. Thank you. Got one over here. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Luke Burrow from Cicero, Indiana. Um, changing gears a little bit, I wanted to ask you guys about your trail camera um, setups and timing throughout the year and then tips or tricks or anything like that to try to uh, improve your trail camera camera uh, performance and I'd like to hear about that last one specifically from both of you because I know that Terry deals with a little different terrain than you do in central Illinois. Mm -hmm. Well my trail cam strategy is I put my trail cameras out about the first of July in fact uh, my fourth of July uh, tradition if you will is that I'm putting out trail cameras on the fourth of July Um, and then I pull them in about this time of the year when I'm looking for shed antlers or, or something like that. Uh, so that that's the period of time I put them out. As far as tricks for getting them, um, getting bucks in front of the camera, any place where deer 
movement is funneled down. You know, I talked about a, a culvert across the creek earlier. Um, that's a great place. I've got a, a camera on a culvert crossing the creek on my farm. Um, an open gate. Um, legendary bow hunter Roger Rothar told me when I was about 18, 19 years old, um, looked up to him and uh, started writing him handwritten letters as a kid, and he would, he would always reply. And I remember the first time I met him in person, he told me that a mature buck will go 100 yards or more out of his way to walk through an open gate than to jump that fence. And that's something that's always stuck with me um, for 40 years or more now. Um, anything that will concentrate that movement. But the other thing is that uh, in, in recent years that I've started doing, because of the, I, over the years I've got a lot of pictures of bucks one time, and you get their picture and they're on to where that camera's at, and they're on to the camera, and they're not coming back. So instead of facing my camera like down the trail, I, I will – face it parallel to the trail, and I will put it up a little bit higher. In fact, a lot of times I carry a couple of screw-in tree steps just so I can get up and put that camera, you know, eight feet or so off of the ground facing down at that trail. The deer are passing it, and they, they don't seem to catch on to it as well. And um, you'd be shocked at, at how many bucks will avoid a trail camera. Another thing I've just started doing last year was the first time I started doing it and, and I'm going to write an article about it, which I haven't yet, so don't anybody steal my idea here. <laughs> but uh, if you're a trapper, you've probably heard of gang sets, where a trapper goes in and he'll put a whole bunch of traps in a small area because if a family of raccoons or a pack of coyotes comes by, it gives him a chance to catch multiples. Well, I, I've started putting my trail cameras in, in certain areas like that in multiples. So in other words, you got maybe a... Uh, a, a ditch with a, a few trees along that ditch and maybe there's a deer trail down the, the, the middle of those trees along the creek or whatever. Um, I, I'll, have a, I'll have a camera there on that trail within the, the strip of cover and then I'll have one on each outside edge. So if a buck walks either edge or if he walks down the middle, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get him one of the three. I, I think uh, we probably don't realize how many pictures we miss of mature bucks that were within 20 yards of our camera. Maybe it was 20 yards behind us or whatever. I've also, uh, in a couple of instances, in fact, I just pulled cameras uh, uh, about a week ago uh, um, where I had two cameras on one tree facing opposite directions. So it didn't matter which way the buck went around that tree, I was getting his picture. Um, I, I've never seen anybody write about that or talk about that before, but gang sets, just like a trapper puts out gang sets for the fur he's trying to catch, I'll do that for the bucks I'm trying to get pictures of. If you're in a state that can use, you can use uh, bait, that, that's a good way to get pictures. Um, I think a lot of mature bucks get onto that pretty quick, so that, that would be a spot where you would want to use multiple cameras. Um, I, I mean, the list goes on scrapes in, in the, during the rut are a great place. In the spring, you know, or the summer, I've found that uh, in my area, the, the bucks will bachelor group in the same spots year after year after year. So when I put out those first cameras in July, I'm literally going to the same tree and putting that camera in the exact same spot facing the same way year after year after year. And then usually towards the end of summer, about the time when bucks are shedding velvet, I'll pull those off of those um, summer feeding areas and I'll put them on scrapes or... or um, funnel areas within the cover where the bucks are going to pass through as they're cruising looking for does or whatever but uh, just uh, you know a, per a person could really write a book just on trail cameras trail cameras are the biggest game changer that I've seen in in 40 some years of deer hunting I think this will be my 45th season and uh, there is nothing that has made the sport or changed the sport as much as trail cameras and uh, in fact it it's made Killing big bucks almost easy in some cases. Your turn. I'm going to answer it a little bit different way because I think that pretty much clarified everything. <clears throat> um, if I took Steve Shields' camera that he's running right beside you right now and uh, when it was 10 degrees outside and took it off a tree and threw it in a backpack, would he cringe? He would absolutely freak out. And even though the camera is made a little bit differently. We have to realize that that is a digital camera inside of a hard plastic case in the middle of the winter. 
And the thing that I've really seen a big difference in my cameras is when I started really treating them with just kid gloves. Absolutely not banging them around, not carrying them in a backpack with a bunch of stuff banging around at them. Um, I usually pull my cameras out of state cameras in March because that's when I go in for the master class. It just saves trips. And uh, the first thing I do when I get home is pull battery packs out, pull batteries, and I save those little silicon packs that we get and everything that you get with moisture. And I just have a cardboard box that has dividers in them, and I throw one of those below every camera to suck that moisture down out. And even using some cheap cameras that I've tested, I firmly believe that handling them like it's one of these cameras not throwing them in on the truck seat or in your side-by-side -side or backpacks or whatever, and then making sure I dry them out really well extends the life of that camera a lot more. Um, and especially on nighttime pictures, that's where I started noticing them a lot. Coolant, or uh, not coolant, um, that's my day job's word, but um, water intrusion is probably the biggest thing that hurts cameras. Eventually the plastic cracks and you get moisture inside of it, starts corroding, or the cheap, Chinese little connections inside with solder end up breaking. Um, but over the last couple of years, that's something that I've started doing much different than I used to. And I'm buying more expensive cameras now, so I want to protect that investment as long as I can. Um, but I think it's really made a difference in, you know, making sure I take care of that camera even, even better. Even, even when I hang a camera, uh, how many times do we have like a eight foot long strap and we're putting it on a tree this big and we're trying to hold everything with our knee up and then all of a sudden that camera swings down around and smacks the side of the tree. I mean, um, I've gotten to where even I get extra straps and, and cut them shorter for those short trees just so they're easier to hang. Anytime we jar that camera, we got to think that it's one of these high end ones here that, that we could do damage to the electronics. I know that probably wasn't where you thought I was going, but it's it's something I've changed here recently. No, it's helpful. Thank you. Yep. I am the least techie person in this room, and Steve Shields will admit that. Well, second techie. He's probably the first one. So. Are you more techie than no, me? No, I, I thought you said least techie. I said the second least. You're the least techie. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. And Steve agrees. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got time for just a couple more questions, so make your way up here. I know somebody's got – Susanna, come up here and ask Donna questions. No, she's shaking her head no. <laughs> I said I would embarrass you tomorrow, not today, so. <laughs> she stuck her tongue out of me. <laughs> hey, we're going to get that on camera. What if you got a property that uh, – I've got – I own some ground down in southern Indiana, and uh, – I had a consultant come about five years ago, and the, the, this bottom ground is too thick. It's full of like a autumn olive, bush honeysuckle, you know, cedars. And what, what this fella did is he, I already had a food plot, and he cut what he called a sneak buck sneak trail on the sides of it, right through that thick stuff. Well, come to find out that, you know, this kind of put me on this quest of learning land management because the deer wouldn't use it. They wouldn't use it at all because of more or less a predator trap, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So they go around the outside edge of it. So I'm wanting to make this bottom more useful. So I thought about ordering a, or, or hiring a forestry mulcher or renting one and then trying to make it like a spider web type thing where they can move through the, the bottom of that property or if I didn't know if I should open it up and, and like let it go back to its natural vegetation. I don't really know what to do with it. Well, without seeing it, it's really hard to say. But, uh, you, you know, those invasives are, it's a never-ending battle. Um, if you would start, you know, trying to control those, the bush honeysuckle or whatever, um, you're going to be fighting that battle your entire life, and you're never going to win. Um, it, is it an area that's flat enough that you could clear it out and put a food plot? I already did that. I make mean, it, I put make it a bigger. couple. Is it a 10-acre food plot? Oh, I probably have six acres. You got four to go. <laughs> uh, um, without seeing it, it's really hard to say, and I'm not trying to dodge your question, but, uh, you know, what's your property need? Do you need bedding cover? Do you need more food? 
Does your six acre food plot, is there still food left every spring? Yeah. So you got enough food. Yeah. Then uh, you need to somehow enhance that as bedding cover. Well, that's, that's more what I was wanting to do, and I didn't know if I should make pockets in within that cover, within that existing autumn olive or mm-hmm. you know, that junk pretty much is what it is. It, it's just pretty tough for me to give specific advice without seeing it. Yeah, I'll, give you, I'll give you a scenario of some advice he gave me. Does that help? Sure. So on the north side of my lease is an old horse pasture that's been taken over by – the same thing, just all invasive. That's what this I mean, this stuff is a jungle. If a deer ever went in there and died, I think I would have to take a mulching hit in to go in and get it. Okay, yeah. it's that it's that gnarly. Um, I tried to cut. We took a mulching hit in there just to cut the lane back this year, so I didn't scratch the side of my truck when we went in. By the time he went to plant my food plots in May, it was already grown back. Mm-hmm. So. Either I have to go in, we've talked about hiring a dozer, because if you just cut that stuff off, you're going to have to put millions of gallons of Toradon on there to, to kill everything. It's just going to come back and stimulate growth. So you'd end up having to take basically a dozer in and pull all the roots up, pile them up, burn them. That's just a lot of work on a property I don't own. What his idea is, let that go. And then in between two food plots where we have on different parts, there is a huge gully that's more hardwoods right there. And we can hunt that area of the farm with two predominant winds and it'd be really good, but it's just a steep cliff. And we're gonna try to go in there and put a culvert in and make that bridge. So that we can't, I, in this case, I don't know about your farm, I can't do anything with that invasive right there. On a, especially on a lease property. I mean, we'd spend tens of thousands of dollars trying to reclaim that pasture. Mm-hmm. But there's an area just south of it that I can get to very effectively without any intrusion to funnel deer and let them use that invasive as cover and then trap them coming out going to food either way and just try to find a pinch somewhere around it. Um, I, I, I don't think that that stuff is so nasty now that I have a property that has it on it. I don't know that I'm going to spend a dollar trying to control it. Just I'm, I'll try to keep from scratching my truck up with it. That's about it. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't know if there's yeah. another choice in that property other than put, pull a big dozer in and just peel it all out. Well, this, it's pretty much what I did last year to make the food plots. It's hire a dozer come in. I'm wanting to increase the bedding at the bottom. It's a, it's a low ground and then it goes up the hill. It's a hundred mm-hmm. acres of, but it wasn't, a, it was all a, it was pasture is what it was. So you're wanting to it hold was. deer then. I'm That's wanting to hold goal. deer at the bottom. See, I already, see, I already have deer. The property's a half mile long. I've, gotcha. I've got deer at the top, but I'm wanting to have deer at the bottom. So I'm wanting to know if, I should, if I'd be better off to clear and plant switchgrass or if I'd be better off to make pockets of, to let the deer, you know, and then try to console the evasives within the pockets for the deer to, to bed. Mm-hmm. I, I very rarely advise a client to remove one form of cover and replace it with another. But in this situation, it might be one of the exceptions. Um, Can you burn it? Yeah. Down there? Yeah. As far as I know, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That might be your best option. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Got one more. One more. First, I want to ask Terry. Um, He's the one on the show, not me. I just push the buttons. Well, when we started, you said you're the best-looking guy here. No, that's Austin. Austin, will you raise your hand, please? No, just kidding. Just wondering who told you that. Had to be your mom. <laughs> Even she won't admit that, unfortunately. Uh, my question for Don. Um, if you get on a property and you look at this property and you – have 10 acres, 20 acres to do it. What is your favorite shape for a food plot? Probably not square. Right. Is it bean-shaped, oval, or? Long and narrow. I, ideally, I'd like to be able to shoot my bow, and I, I don't want to shoot over 30 yards. I'd like to shoot my bow across the, the, the plot, and as long as it needs to be. You don't care if it's straight or you want? No. 
I mean, if it can wind around a little bit, you know, that creates some advantage. A buck comes out. If he wants to see what's in the other end of the plot, he's got to move some. But, you know, deer naturally, they don't want to just come out and stand in one spot and feed anyway. They're going to browse by. And another advantage with those long, narrow plots is a deer just doesn't come in front of you and stay there and, and eventually pick you off. You know, that they, they feed past you and uh, gives you a chance to get out and, just a lot of advantages that way. I didn't know I had a food plot last year, and it was shaped like a boot. You know, it just had a little bit of an oval out there. I think every deer had to go over there into that little uh -huh. toe of the yeah. boot. I mean, I would much rather have an odd-shaped plot than just like a long, narrow rectangle, uh, for sure. I mean, a lot of times we just, when we um, lay out plots on clients' properties, we kind of follow the terrain, you know, you the ridges aren't just square and you, you pick a flat stop spot on top of a ridge or wherever and, and you make it the shape that the uh, terrain allows you to make it. So in one spot it may be 20 yards wide, in another spot it may be 50 yards wide. I think people pick their food plot spot before they pick their stand location. And, and I think that gets people in trouble a lot. They say, oh, well I have this field I'm gonna put a food plot in and don't have any idea of how they're going to hunt that food plot. There, there has to be a, a game plan for access, exit, and where you're going to hunt before you worry about the shape or size. Well, size is going to be big, but where you're, exactly your food plot's going to be. I think people look at it backwards. Well, some properties don't give you many options. The one I was on in Michigan yesterday, uh, there was basically <laughs> two options, and they were neither one It was one where good. it was. <laughs> yeah, it was going to be where it was going to be. But you're right, Terry, if you've got options, um, the, where you put that plot needs to be strategic. You, you need to know where those deer are bedded and then know where you're going to put your plot and how are you going to hunt them as they go from point A to point B. Okay. Next question. Next question. Um, so if you make a trail to your stand, you might uh, round up it or make a trail to where you can slide in there. And uh, that's the same thing you do to route your deer to a certain spot. How do you keep the deer? You're going to say, well, you got all your trails on the edge of the property. You don't have a problem with that. But uh, how do you keep the deer from using the same trail you are using? I, I really don't spray trails to my stand. I mean, it, it's very rare. Uh, I'll use a pair of pruners, and I'll, I'll cut a, a trail to my stand. But you're exactly right. If you create too much of a trail to your stand for yourself, the deer will be using it. And I made that mistake in the past, and I just hardly do it anymore. Thank you. Thank yep. you. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap up the show. Um, you got any closing comments for everybody? No, here? I was hoping Tony LaPratt would show up, and I was going to bra drag him up here and ask him if he wants. There he is. Tony, what Tony. perfect timing. Come on up, Tony. We got a question for you. <laughs> He's like, oh, no. What is he has no on? idea what he walked into. And uh, we had a question, Tony, just to give you a, a little background here. <laughs> I had a gentleman ask a question about you and I. And uh, I wasn't sure how to answer it. And uh, I'm hoping you can give a much better answer. So I'll, I'll let you come up here to this mic. And I apologize for putting you on the spot. But uh, <laughs> I'm real nervous. <laughs> <laughs> So here, right down. Oh. Th there, there's a actually a mic right yeah, there. Yeah, just pick it up and hand it to him, Mary. There we go. Okay, so what are we talking about? <laughs> so Tony, I had a young man, believe it or not. It, where's he at? Right over here somewhere. He wanted to know if Nancy Pelosi was a deer hunter, should she hire me or you? And I told him that I'd go ahead and let you have Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> I would like to take that job. <laughs> It's all yours. And then we would solve a lot of problems. <laughs> because every alpha doe needs taken out once in a while. Great answer. Great answer. Okay? Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Fill the tag. <laughs> That's worth the price of admission That's, right there, folks. I couldn't have come up with a better answer myself. <laughs> and guys, tomorrow's going to be fun. They'll, we'll have a little disagreement here and there, trust me. But uh, it will be fun and entertaining. 
Well, yeah. the the big thing the big thing here is that uh, we're gonna have a little fun, but we're gonna raise a lot of money to help a lot of people. That's and the then, best part. That's that's the awesome part. Um, you know, the Shipshawana community has been special to even. I'm I'm gonna speak for Tony because he comes here a lot too. This area has been special to all of us for many, many years. So um, as we close out this episode, I just want to thank each of you all for braving the storm tonight. I hope each of you are coming back. Uh, Don and I will be on the, out at the booth. Actually, Tony, Don, we all have a commitment. We have to be at 8 o'clock to practice a little bit for tonight, um, tomorrow night. But um, please stick around for Tony's seminar. We'll be at the booth. We hope to see everybody uh, tomorrow evening. Thanks a lot. Chasing Giants has been brought to you by Osseo Camo, Via Farm Real Estate Company, 360 Hunting Blinds, Victory Chevrolet, Real World Wildlife Products, Matthews Archery, Novix Tree Stands, Gingerich Tree Farm, WildlifeFarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode of Chasing Giants. You know, the reason they, they like reading my stuff is that I've always got real-life examples to prove what I'm saying. There's a lot of good people that listen to this podcast. You know, other than God and my family, deer hunting would be next in line on my list of priorities. From the bottom of our hearts, it's it's just fantastic and awesome to uh, to have the support that you guys are getting. People ask me about expandable broadheads and love swings. <laughs> <laughs> Chasing Giants with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Brought to you by Osseo Camo, nature's most lethal camouflage. Follow along as Don and Terry discuss the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Well, welcome everyone to Chasing Giants podcast brought to you by Osseo Gear. Uh, This is episode 105, part two. We are on the last day of the Ship Shawana show, um, and another huge crowd here in the arena today. Um, we're going to merge these two together from the episode Thursday. Yeah, it's been a fantastic show, Terry. I've been on my feet the entire time I've been in this building um, since the show started with just a continual flow of people past our booth, and uh, with the debate last night, it's just been fantastic. Well, we got a big audience today. Uh, before we start, raise your hand if you were here last night for the debate. A uh, big portion of you. Everybody yeah. enjoy it? Thumbs up if you enjoyed it? Yeah, good. So um, uh, we're going we're gonna to have a good episode here with a lot of questions. I'm guessing that there's going to be a bunch of follow-up questions of what people heard last night. That wouldn't surprise me any. But before we kick off too much more, I want you to introduce our special guest for today. Yeah, right, sitting between Terry and I is my oldest grandson, Wyatt. And believe it or not, Wyatt's already shot two bucks, two whitetail bucks that uh, right here in his home state of Indiana. And uh, I was there when he shot his first one, actually got it on video. So he's an accomplished deer hunter, believe it or not, at the ripe old age of 10 years old. Is that true, Wyatt? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Tell, show everybody how big the buck was. Was it this big? Mm, like that. Yeah. And, and Grandpa's bucks are like this, right? Ears are like this and Grandpa's bucks? Not really. Not really? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you know, um, uh, one, of the, one of the most awesome questions we heard last night on the podcast is, or on the debate was somebody asked Don if he would take, let his grandkids go rabbit hunting in his sanctuary and I don't know if any of you are surprised by the answer, but I was not. Um, what, what this man stands for, especially with his country and most of all his family, has never been questioned in my mind. So I know a lot of you all kind of giggled when he didn't hesitate with that answer, but I, I wasn't surprised one bit when you said you'd choose your, your grandsons over a big buck. Yeah, I I was standing up here on the stage with uh, two of the bucks, two of the biggest bucks I'd shot right behind me, and I'm sure a lot of people watching probably thought that, uh, you know, that was my my passion, my, you know, the primary thing in my life was those big bucks, but 
actually the most important thing in my life was standing out here on that front or sitting out here on that front row. It was my family and um, they mean the world to me and I would walk away from deer hunting today if, if it meant uh, choosing between my family and deer hunting or yeah. if it would help my family in some way. So uh, I always encourage people to have their priorities in order. You know, deer hunting is a fantastic hobby. It's, it's been my life. I've made it my living, but there's more important things. Uh, God's more important, first of all, and our families are more important. So I just don't want anybody to ever lose sight of that. Well, we've been standing in the booth for hours on end. The, the, the great thing about this show is we get to see some great friends. Uh, we, we truly consider a lot of people from this show friends. And it's one time of the year that we get a chance to catch up. But we met a lot of new people. Uh, anything come to mind as a common topic as people kind of came through the booth this time? Well, it's, uh, it's very obvious to me that the podcast is really catching on. And uh, I can't tell you how many people come by and said, hey, I listen to you every week. Keep up the good job. And, you know, we take a stand on politics. We take a stand on uh, our Christianity. And some people don't like that. Um, for the most part, people either, with me, they're either on one side of the fence or the other. They really like me or they really don't. <laughs> and I really don't care. So um, I, I really appreciate the folks that are behind me, though, because... Uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be doing this podcast if we didn't have an audience that, that would listens to us and supports us. And uh, we're just trying to be a voice of reason in a world that's gone mad. And uh, hopefully we're speaking for most of our audience every time we open our mouths. The, the interesting thing about how we are, um, for, for those of you who don't listen to the podcast a lot, I've talked about this story when Don had the idea of doing a podcast and he asked me, my first answer through my seventh answer was no. Um, uh, it's, it's just not my style. I don't like being up on the stage. I like being more behind the scenes. But it got to the point that I said, are we going to openly talk about our faith? And he said, I wouldn't be doing it if we weren't. And uh, I think that was just the kind of the small seeds of, of everybody in this room finding something that you enjoy or that you do or that you have a network with and finding a way to do something good with it. And I have no doubt that that's part of the reason God's blessed us and blessed this podcast is because we've tried to do something bigger than just talk about deer hunting. Any, any of these people in this room could listen to any podcast that just focuses on deer hunting 24-7. Right. And, you know, another thing that's stuck out in my mind about this weekend, Terry, has been – uh, the debate with Tony, I had no idea how that was going to go. I didn't know if he was going to uh, walk over and punch me at some point, you know. And, but uh, <laughs> it, it was, uh, I knew I had to speak my mind, I always do. And uh, Tony is an absolute first-class gentleman. I, I told the story at the end of the debate last night on how Tony and I met. And uh, I, I've got nothing but respect for that guy. I disagree with him on a lot of his deer hunting philosophy, he disagrees with me on a lot of mine, but as a person, Tony LaPratt's as good as it comes. You know, I, I, I wasn't surprised in how it went down because I, I knew the two of you would handle yourselves exactly like you were. What I was worried about is, you know, you got your Don followers and he's got his Tony followers. I didn't know if we got to a certain point, somebody going to get stabbed in the back <laughs> row back there. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, I think everybody that was here enjoyed the time. We raised a lot of money for charity. We'll be announcing stuff about that. Um, hey, I'm going to put you on the spot. What was your favorite part of the debate last night? Um, the mechanical broadheads part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to guess that you don't believe in shooting mechanical broadheads either, do you? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. Chip off the block. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing he's heard that speech once or twice. He actually listens to the podcast every week, don't you? Yeah, he? that's why you have to keep it clean because we know he's listening to it. His yeah. mama will get on you. That's true. That <laughs> is true. Um, I, I do want to offer an apology. Um, I, I didn't sleep well last night because I, I walked out of here last night, and you know sometimes you just get in the wrong frame of mind. And I was actually complaining to Don a little bit because I said something to the effect of, I stood in this one spot for five hours, I'm exhausted. And it was almost like I was treating that as a negative thing. And I got to the hotel last night and I said, how stupid are you that you got a chance to, to talk with all of these friends from this area that, about something that you really enjoy? So 
Um, I really apologize if I came off, I was tired and I haven't slept well lately. And, um, if, if I seem like I was unappreciative sitting there talking to the flood of people that clogged up that aisle yesterday, I want you to know that both Don and I truly covet and I feel blessed that everybody's in this room, uh, wanting to listen to us and come to the booth and talk to us. It, it really does mean a lot. Um, I'm going to give a quick update about Lester's feet real quick before we open it up to questions. So you got to get ready and, and have your questions ready. Um, if you weren't here last night, the raffle is going to open up in just a couple weeks, and uh, our board of directors met in this room last night after the debate. We'll have everything getting going uh, in the near future. I announced Thursday that we did have an additional big item donated. Um, a, one of the dealerships in Indiana and a private donor went together and donated a John Deere 1025R with a loader. So we do have a tractor in the, in the raffle now with a post frame building, material kit, and a, a new truck. So um, I think we're up over about 70 prizes that total around $130,000 right now. And um, there's going to be some different things in there and we'll have ways that if you don't or can't accept one of the prizes that you win, there'll be ways to donate that back to the foundation or to a family that needs it. So. Um, keep an ear out on the podcast. We're going to be talking more about that as we go. But that's going to be opening up very soon. Um, we, we ask that you guys help us spread the word in that. You'll be able to mail in tickets or buy them online. Um, but we'll work with the Busy Beaver to get those uh, um, materials out to you. So outside of that, you got anything before we open it up? And whoever's got the first, it's always tough to get the first guy to come up to the question. So whoever's got that first question, start making your way up here. Um, we got to have it. We got to have it. Oh, that didn't take long. I was going to say, I recognize people out there. I can call them out by yeah, name. Yeah, if we if don't I have them, to. we will call them out. <laughs> and it might be advice on gutters, even if I don't have anything else to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I got some giggles in the front row right there. All right. Well, uh, get close to that mic and uh, state your name, social security number. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. What's your question? My name is Justine, and I'm from Ohio. I want to know when deer switch back off of their fall-winter patterns to their summer patterns. That makes sense. It does make sense. Okay. And it's a great uh, question. Actually, you know, I, I wondered about that for, for a lot of years, and then a couple of years ago, um, in March, I went to a spot where there's always a bachelor group of bucks in the summer, and... I was doing some tree stand work and I was trying to get it done before spring green up. And when I went in there to do that work, there was already three bucks that had just started uh, growing their antlers. They had two or three inches sticking out of their heads, but they were back in, where they summer um, in March. Now, I don't know if they always move in that early, but uh, I think it, it varies a little bit with the, the weather in a particular year. But, um, you know, as soon as that weather starts uh, to break a little bit for spring, um, you know, the grass starts to turn green and stuff, I think those bucks head out to, to where they're going to summer. Big row ag might, might play a part in that based on when it plants, when it comes up. You know, in, yep. your, in your area of the um, country, you know, you, the, these bucks will be out in big open ag. They might still be over in hedgerows and stuff until crops get up. But. Right. But that shift, I think, starts earlier than what most people pretty much think. And even earlier than I suspected. But the takeaway for your question that I would challenge you on isn't just when it is. Um, that's why we also try to encourage all your habitat work to be done as early as possible to get out before any of that happens. That's a good question. Uh-oh, this one's going to be a good one. This is the arrow specialist right here. Nope. Nathan Matter from uh, Vesterberg, Michigan. Uh, just a question uh, on on a sanctuary. How close do you uh, put it, or how far away would you stay from a building before you would l utilize the woods? Or I've actually laid out sanctuaries for clients that go right up to buildings. Um, it just it, it varies by the layout of the property, how many how much acreage they've got to work with. But if you're dealing with a smaller property, you need to utilize almost every square foot that you can. And uh, if that requires bringing that sanctuary right up to the edge of a building. And here's another interesting way that I use buildings on some of my plans is, especially in a state like um, 
say, Ohio or Kentucky where you're allowed to put bait out, um, that, that's a great place to shoot your does. Put a bait pile outside the, the building and go in the building and shoot them out the window. And, uh, you know, it's a good way to keep from putting pressure on your buck stands. Tony was just talking about that in the seminar right before this podcast. Don't shoot your does from your buck stands. And that's a great way to utilize old buildings. So that goes for uh, when you have families with uh, children running out, out and around about still the same same idea? Yeah, it can because those deer get used to that. They understand, you know, human activity that represents danger and human activity that's just every day. And hearing them kids out running around in the yard yelling at each other and whatever doesn't really represent danger to them. They get used to that. Now, that doesn't mean a mature buck is going to come in bed right at the edge of the yard, but... Uh, it gives you a little bit of a buffer from, you know, where that human activity is at and where the deer are actually going to bed. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah, I thanks, think, Nathan. I think we all have a property that lays out different and different objectives of that property. Right. And what, what you just said is you might have a smaller piece of property that you want to hunt a buck on, and but you also might want to take your kid or your grandkid, Right. So using a technique like that where we put a feeder right out the back of the barn, keep your kid in the barn, you know, shoot out a crack in the door or punch out a, a wooden slat instead of taking him back and hunting in your buck spot and burning it up, you know. Because if you hunt back there, no doubt you shoot a doe, it's running into your sanctuary every single time. So, Hello, Don and Terry. This is uh, John Yoder from Goshen, Indiana. I have uh, two questions here. Uh, the first one is regarding how do you keep hunters off your property line? And the uh, second one, what is your opinion on saddles? A T20 Swift with a suppressor. No, I'm just kidding. Is that your opinion on saddles or people <laughs> setting the property line? <laughs> uh, you want to take the saddle question first, Terry? Yeah. Um, Good. I... Th- I would never put my fat rear end in something hanging from a tree. I know people say it's safer, but good grief, people. I've had two surgeries in the last 13 months. If I tried to get in one of them things, I'd be hanging upside down with part of it around my neck. So um, I was over in the Cloverleaf booth uh, walking by the other day, and they were doing a demonstration on it. And I just sat down. They, they're a real-world dealer, so they had a stack of seed there. And I didn't get close to it. I just sat down and watched it. And he saw me over there, and he looked at me, don't you say it. Don't you say it from up on that pole. <laughs> um, I think that the people that use it for the right reasons and if they're comfortable in it and they can stay still, more power to you. It's not for me. Um, I think with our style of hunting where we set up a property with a specific wind and a specific entrance and exit, I can always get in and out quicker quieter and stay still more still and quieter out of a tree stand than me trying to go up and hunt out of a harness these guys that are going in on public land that need to go in and backpack in and and do that kind of stuff i see i see that application but i'm not that hunter so Mm -hmm. i have no problem with people who saddle hunt we do have a problem with west delks doing it just because we like picking on him and that's really where the whole conversation started a year and a half ago was us finding a way to pick on west about it and I think uh, Wes learned pretty quick. The old guys knew what they were talking about. He uh, told us how he was going to hunt with saddles for a season. And uh, we told him that he'd be hanging it up pretty quick. Well, he didn't make it 30 days, and that saddle's laid in his closet ever since. And it's got its place. If somebody's happy hunting with a saddle, you know, it's none of my business. Good for them. Have at it. But hey, it's just not for me. I like to have my stands preset. I like to slip in there as quiet as I can. I, I don't want to be throwing ropes around a tree or screw in steps or whatever, however they get up there. I, I want it all ready to go. And I think here's the bigger picture. It's not the saddle that really it goes against our grain. It's the style of hunting with a saddle that most mm-hmm. people do where they're just burning up a property, going from tree to tree to tree. And on public land, that might be necessary, but with the properties that we manage, it's just not our style. Right. Um, it's, it's more the activity that goes with the saddle hunting that kind of goes against the way we set properties up. I hope that answered the question. 
Right. And the second question was about people setting property lines. Um, I, I really haven't had much problem with that. Um, my neighbors that, that surround my property know that I make my living through deer hunting, and, and they look out for my best interest. Now, I don't have um, much woods that, that joins my property line. Most of it on the neighboring side of the, the fence is farm fields. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's been situations I know of many people that have had to deal with a neighbor that has nothing but a farm field and some deer hunter comes and sits up a ground blind out in some corn stalks or something to shoot the deer coming out of the neighbor's woods. Um, but for me, I guess I'm just extremely blessed that, that my neighbors understand how I make my living and they're looking out for me. Now, I'm in the market right now for another property um, in my area, and that might become an issue. Um, I, I try to be a good neighbor. You know, if someone shoots a deer and it runs onto my property, I, I, I want them to recover it. If I can help them recover it, I will. Um, I hope they will show the same in return. Um, yeah, I, like, like I've said before, treat your neighbor the way you want them to treat you. And if uh, they're sitting in the line, and you might have a talk with them. But I, I've really not have much experience with that so I, I i can't offer too much advice we had a really good conversation with uh i'm sure they're probably in this room right now uh, somebody coming by asking well what county should i buy property in what county and it, i told him i said it's more about the neighbors than it is the county right and how you figure out what the neighbors are doing you can have the best genetic pocket and county in the world and if you have bad neighbors you're going to have a horrible hunting property right so uh, neighbors are just as important what they do as what you do on yours. For sure. Here's our buddy. Ray Miller, uh, Northeast Ohio. Uh, as a land manager, is there anything you can do to attract and then keep uh, yearling bucks as they disperse? Or are they just going from point A to B and they really don't know where they're going? Well, I, I think you do that with quality habitat and food. Um, that's going to attract a doe herd, which is going to attract the, even the young bucks. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, when a buck is a year and a half, there, there's no year and a half old buck that's really any smarter than the next year and a half old buck. And I think what allows some of those year and a half old bucks to live to older age classes, five, six years old, I think that some of them just luck into finding a sanctuary, you know, a place where the hunting pressure is not as great. Maybe they're protected. If, a property like yours or mine, um, where we're not ever going to shoot a year and a half old buck, we're going to give them a chance to, to see what they can become. And uh, there, there's no way to influence which yearling bucks are going to stay on our farms and which aren't. I wish there was because it seems like I end up with a bunch of spikes and fork horns staying around, and the good young little eight point basket racks are, are the ones you want, and they, they end up going elsewhere. Um, by the end of the season, you know, they're there through the rut and, and, and off and on. But th those yearling bucks, you know, it's Mother Nature's way of preventing inbreeding. They're covering a lot of ground. And uh, you'll have yearling bucks show up on your place, new ones, anywhere from the 1st of June clear through the late season. Um, you might have one on your farm in October that you hope stays, but he may just be passing through. And, and I've really not found a way to... Uh, you know, encourage them to stay other than provide the best habitat and all the food they could possibly want. Second question, uh, on the Mel video, when he came out into the plowed field as a three-year-old, if he would have got a snout full of your scent, uh, do you think you would have been able to kill him from that same tree later on, even if you would have been on the opposite side in the sanctuary? Well, he actually, he did smell me in, in that field. He was walking across that, cutting that corner, and he hit my scent, and he turned around and came back. He refused to cross it, and he came back. The interesting thing is that, and I've said this before, I, I believe the deer on my farm know my smell over another person's smell. Um, I, I, if I go out by myself hunting, deer often react like what you've seen in the Mel video. They, they don't flip out. They know I'm there, and they just slip back into the cover. A doe might flare her tail and put her head up and try, kind of trot back into the cover. But if I have a cameraman with me, so I got that strange smell of the cameraman, 
and a deer comes downwind, uh, they, they flip out. They start snorting and blowing and going crazy just like they do anywhere else. And, and I don't think that happens overnight. I think what happens is I've been managing that farm for about 30 years now, and, and you know, I'm out there working my food plots. I'm you know, mowing my clover, things like that. And I, I think those deer have smelled me from the time basically they showed up on the farm, whether they were fawns born there or they were bucks that, that migrated in. Um, I think my smell was a pretty regular ingredient, if you will, on that property, and they've come to accept me as not really that much of a threat. It's and an association. Uh, they associate Don with something positive or something secure. Yep. You know, I mean, it's it's true. You talk about people that supplemental feed a lot. That that buck knows you're going in to fill that feeder, but he knows that he's not in danger. You didn't jump that deer up. You didn't bump him. You're leaving something for him to eat when you leave. And and right. I think they're smarter in that regard than what most people think. No doubt about it. I want to I want to ask a quick spinoff question of your first question, though, where he said about yearling bucks. Has any of your articles, and I don't know this question, I'm not teeing you up, has any of your articles talked about, say we have a great spot of late season food in food plots and habitat in a, in a safe place that a, a button buck is born before he disperses? Or is there a period of time where that buck might come back? You know, he might disperse and go somewhere else. Does he ever run mm -hmm. back to where he was born to either check for does during the rut or late season food because he remembers that spot from where he was born and grew up his first year? Yeah, it's kind of interesting that, you know, I've got my farm, my 120 acres, and which I run trail cameras on, but I, I've got a lot of trail cameras. So I, I branch out around my farm for basically about two to three miles in every direction. So a lot of the deer that I get there, photo on my farm I also get them in outlying areas and uh, it's it's really uncanny the, the patterns of these deer because they will winter on my farm and then buck a he goes to the same spot two miles away to summer with a bachelor group every year buck b he goes a different direction and summers with a different bachelor group in the summer but they always end up back in my place in the fall. But the really interesting thing <clears throat> is that I don't have new bucks other than yearlings coming in and out. The older bucks, say three and older, I don't get new ones during the rut whatsoever. Well, what was there in late October is there throughout the month of November. No new ones coming in. But right after the rut, I start getting new older bucks showing up. They're showing up for that winter food. And they're bucks that not only have I never got their photo on my farm, but a lot of times I've never got them in those outlying areas two miles away either. So they're coming from farther away than that. And I always wondered how they knew to come to my place for food if they were two or three or five or ten or who knows how many miles away. And my theory has always been that, that those bucks were on my farm as fawns with their mother. Their first winter they were alive. And there's always been plentiful food there. And then the next spring they disperse and, and they move. It's Mother Nature's way of preventing inbreeding. They, they just relocate. And radio collared research has proven or shown that those bucks on, in, in farm country like where I live, those bucks relocate on average five to 20 miles from where they were born. So my theory is those bucks were, were there on my farm as button bucks. They dispersed the next summer. And they moved 5 to 20 miles away. The next winter, weather gets bad, um, food gets scarce, conditions get rough, and they remember where they had food their first winter, and they come back. And it might be that they don't even come back for two or three years after they've dispersed, but that's the only explanation I can figure for how these bucks are coming back and finding my place. It's either that or they're smelling food for 10 miles away. Or out wandering and finally find something. That could so. be. Hey. Hi, Don. Uh, Israel Yoder from Vandalia, Michigan. And I've been wondering if you have like a bucket list of hunts you would enjoy outside of the whitetail experience and if maybe you could expound on one or two or three of those. Mm -hmm. Us. That's a great question. You know, when I was younger, I tried to make a trip out west about every other year. I've hunted elk, mule deer, antelope. Uh, I've been to Canada hunting bear. 
Um, I used to want to hunt everything, but the older I get, the more I, I just want to hunt whitetails. The last hunt I went on for anything else was I went on a moose hunt in Alaska in 2012. I'd always wanted to do that. I always wanted to go to Alaska. And I finally did that in 2012, which is 10 years ago now. And uh, I, to be honest, every year that passes, I have less and less desire to go on those hunts for other things. And in fact, I have less and less desire to even hunt whitetails away from home. I, I, I guess I'm just like an old buck. My home range is shrinking. And I want to sleep in my own bed every single night that I can. I spend way too many nights in a motel in the winter on scouting uh, tri or consulting trips. And uh, I guess the, the bucket list thing that I want to do, the one thing that's left, is I want to kill a giant whitetail on public land. And I've been looking. I, I've got cameras. This year I had cameras on public land in three states. Couldn't find one. And when I say giant, I want at least a 170-inch gross buck. And uh, I've got a couple potentials for this coming year if they put on enough, they put on a little bit more antler growth. They're not 170 yet. But uh, the, the one thing that I've got left on my whitetail list is to kill a giant on public land. So I'm going to keep plugging away. I may never get it done, but that don't mean I'm not going to try. Appreciate the question. Thank you. Don, I'm... Uh not sure what this picture is, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Can you explain more? Well, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. That's Terry in a uh, tree saddle. So uh, you have never, ever, ever seen Don in a picture of a tree saddle. It's actually a lone wolf safety harness. And I did take medication for three days after my knee surgery. So that is me hanging from a tree harness from a winch on a side-by-side -side over a limb in my front yard holding a bow, probably within 30 minutes of taking an oxy. <laughs> so in other, words, in other words, he was not in his right mind when he did that. I did it as a joke to send to Don, and that's literally me hanging from a safety harness holding a bow. And that is now on the video introduction of the podcast, except Steve Shields actually superimposed angel's wings out over top of that. So that's, that's actually for everyone to see that watches the podcast on YouTube now. All right, just making sure that that's not a tree saddle. It is not. All right. I have never been in one. I did hang from a safety harness from a winch on the front of a side-by-side, -side, medicated from knee surgery, though. I can check that off my bucket list so I don't have to worry about that. Pull that mic down so we can hear you. Parker Yoder from Middlebury, Indiana. And... Um, your opinion on how long it takes for a small food plot to become comfortable for a deer to get used to and eat out of it regularly? Uh, great question, Parker. Uh, you, you know, a lot of it depends on the location of the food plot. If it's in an area that the deer feels secure, they will start hitting it almost immediately. Uh, if it's in a place where they don't feel secure, they'll probably start hitting it, hitting it at night and become more comfortable over time. And it's going to, human intrusion, if you listen to this podcast very long, you're going to hear me talk about human intrusion. And if you've got a lot of human pressure around that plot, it's going to take them a lot longer to, to find it and hit it. Um, but uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Thanks for the question, Parker. Okay. Hi, Don. Paul Troyer, uh, Northeast Ohio. Uh, getting back to the question on the yearling box or the button box, we had a doe on our property this past season that had three button bucks and spent a lot of time in the same plot. The year prior, and I'm not 100% it was the same doe, but I think it was she had a buck and a doe fawn. Uh, I was told I should have shot that doe so those buttons stay around. Mm -hmm. I, she produced four bucks in two years and I, I struggled with that a little bit, but what's your opinion on that? Well, there was actually research done by Dr. Carl Miller at the University of Georgia. We've talked about it on here a couple times anyway. Uh, he was doing uh, research on yearling buck dispersal and uh, radio collared a lot of uh, button bucks in, in this research. And what he found was that and that's where I got my figure before. A, a, a buck is going to disperse between 5 and 20 miles. That, that came from Dr. Miller's research. 
And, and what he showed was that if that doe is, is alive, that the mother of those buck fawns, when she gets ready to have her next set of fawns, she's going to drive them buck fawns away, and they're going to wander off and relocate on average 5 to 20 miles from where they're born. His same research showed that if that doe is killed, either by hunters, car, whatever, if that doe is killed, the, the figures reverse. 90% of the time, those buck fawns are going to remain right where they were born and live out their life. So that tells us as a manager, you know, we're, we're trying to, uh, we're pro providing our does the best nutrition possible um, to grow the healthiest fawns. If, we, if that doe is still alive, those fawns are going to end up on somebody else's farm 10 miles away. But if we shoot that doe, the odds are in our favor that th those buck fawns are going to remain close to home. I, I live in an area where we just don't have a lot of deer. We, we've got deer, we just don't have a lot of them. But the doe that is in trouble on my farm is a doe that comes by with twin buck fawns. She's getting hammered because there's a good chance those are going to stay. And uh, you would have been well advised to shoot that doe with three buck fawns. Howdy. Pull, that, pull that up just a little bit. There you go. Howdy. Cal Lehman here. I enjoy your podcast. I listen to it. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one being uh, weather fronts and when to hunt those and stuff. I, I was just wondering if uh, uh, this is something that uh, since we have a, a president that's trying to stop global warming, is this something you would support <laughs> for him to do? Well, <laughs> well I, I don't really support about anything Joe Biden does, to be honest, but uh, glo global warming, boy, that, that's a topic I could get wound up on, but uh, I'm going to try my best to keep it you from winning a prize here. <laughs> um, that's fine. That wasn't my real question. Okay. I had to throw that up there yeah. for you. Uh, my question is you, oh, uh, you, about the memory of a deer. If, uh -huh. if you get busted in a stand by a doe, is, is it necessary to move the stand or, or what extent or how long? Uh, I guess that's my question on, on the memory of a deer. Is it important to move the stand get, if, or a blind or whatever if, if you get busted with a doe? We did have one instance where we, one of the boys got busted in a stand. I just didn't uh -huh. know how, much, how long we got to wait on that, I guess. Well, I, I don't know that it's, it's important that you immediately move that stand the first time a doe busts you, but I do believe if a buck busts you in the tree, um, if it's a mature buck, I, I would say four years and older, you're probably not killing that deer from that tree. Yeah, you can just about lay money on it. Um, but I, I know from experience that the, when an old doe catches on to where you're in the tree, every time she comes through, she's looking for you. And those are the does that you want to shoot to because uh, she, she's going to find you. I, I can remember one stand very vividly where this old doe, every time she came by, she would circle clear out it because my wind would always blow out in this open ag field. And that doe, if she was coming down along the wood's edge, before she would get to where my stand was on that edge, she would loop way out into the field to make sure she could smell that stand. And she would catch me every time, and then she'd stand out there and blow and alert the whole woods. And uh, I, I never did get her shot. I wanted to. I was going to kill her, believe me, if I had the opportunity, but I uh, never did. So I, I don't think it's necessary the first time you get busted, but when you get an old doe that's on to you, it, it's time to either move or kill her or both. Yep. All right, we got one coming up here. Yeah, I'm Kevin Yoder from Bremen, Indiana, and I like to win that prize. So, okay. what's your opinion about deer drives? Deer drives. Well, there are deer hunting tactics and there are deer killing tactics. Um, a deer drive is a deer killing tactic. It takes absolutely zero skill, and um, I, I wish it was outlawed along with mechanical broadheads. <laughs> so. That's it in a nutshell. And I think I kept my cool pretty well, didn't I, Terry? That prize is still out I'm there. I'm a little disappointed in that response, I won't lie. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember, if I'm not mistaken, was it five years ago, six years ago, you had a target three-year-old that was just gigantous, non-typical. I know the buck you're talking about, And too. he got shot on a deer drive and... I think you had another term for the deer drive, but we won't say that one on air. Well, but. 
I, I'll call it what it is. It's a, I, they're gang bangs. <laughs> Earmuffs, son. Earmuffs. All right, we got another question here. <laughs> Philip Miller, Northeast Ohio. Uh, just wondering how, uh, if you could explain how you call out your bucks, and do you really think that Tony could call out, would call out bucks that he could shoot that big bucks in your neighborhood? Well, my method for calling out bucks is basically when they get to be about three years old, you know, every year I'm going to have X number of bucks in each age class. When those bucks get to three years old, typically I will have about six three-year-olds on my farm on a, on a typical year. I, I want to kill the four worst ones, the four smallest, and I want to let the two biggest ones live. And in the wild, uh, in most areas, the, the opposite approach is taken. A guy's sitting in his stand and out walks two bucks. One of them's a, a three-year-old eight-pointer that scores about 120, and the other's a three-year-old 10-pointer that scores about 150. Well, the 10-point, the, the 150-inch buck is getting shot every single time. And on my farm for a number of years, that's the bucks that I've allowed to live to the next age class. And I don't think we can influence genetics a whole lot in, in the wild. But as time goes by, I, I think on certain properties, we can influence it to some degree. Because uh, when I started managing my farm, I've said this before on the podcast too, every year the biggest buck would be about 150 inches. And then about every three to four years, I would get one a little bigger, about a 170. And then I'd be back to three or four years of 150s, and then here's another 170. Today, I, I've got 170s on my farm, and usually multiple 170s every single year. And then about every three to four years, I'll get one bigger. And in 2017, I shot Smokey, which was 206. And then in 2020, three years later, I shot Mel, which was 221. Um, I don't think I have a buck coming up that's going to be in, in that category, but I, I think that the, my culling approach um, ha, has helped my farm. And specifically what I'm looking for typically is, a, is an eight-point rack. If he's got eight points, it's a smooth rack. There's no little bumps where I think, you know, he could have stickers or become a 10-point. Those are the bucks I'm trying to cull out. And uh, it's definitely ha had an impact. I might get in trouble for saying this, but I know Corey, uh, Don's son-in-law, sitting over here, and Corey's, I don't know if anybody else other than us have hunted Don's place before, but there's always bucks on the do not shoot list, right? Okay, and, and when you're hunting this farm, you got to be, like, really careful about it. There isn't no making a mistake on a do not shoot list buck, right? So... I've never seen another piece of property where I've thought to myself, well, something other than a booner walk by that it's something I can shoot. Put that in your mind for a second, okay? <laughs> I mean, am I right? It's like this year there was a, there was a buck that was an eight-pointer that was big, big eight-pointer management buck he one shot, and it was late season. I go there, and I'm literally getting fed up with the booners walking by that, but, I, I mean, it's like, come on. Well, something other than a – why is that? Because it's the only place that I know of, including my properties, that the bucks on those do not shoot list are allowed to go the next year to get to that level. Every other property that I've ever hunted, a 150, 10-pointer walks out, he's getting whacked. It's as simple as that. But he's found that those bucks in that age class have the potential to be something special. The other thing I don't think anybody appreciates is how many bucks you let get shot off your property every year. And I don't know if you can, I mean, ballpark well, the last couple of years. I mean, it, people don't understand. We take, you know, we have sponsors. We have special guests, even though we don't do raffle hunts anymore. Um, there's, a, there's quite a few bucks taken off your place every year. Yeah, on average, on that 120 acres, we're shooting a minimum of four, between four and eight bucks a, a year. And most of them are, are three years, just about all of them are three years old and older. So uh, we're giving them a chance. We're giving them the first three racks to show us what, they, what their potential is. And uh, if they're showing us potential, well, guess what? They get to live to five or six. 
If they don't, we're trying to get them out of there at three, and if we don't get it done at three, we're coming back at four and trying to get them. And usually in two seasons, somebody's going to get an opportunity. But it, it's that really heavy culling, because not only do those bucks get taken out of the herd, but your better bucks are left to do the breeding. So I, I think that has helped somewhat too, and, and doing that over a number of years has really improved my farm. So the method that he goes about it is the years that he has smokier mel, he's doing most of that culling in the late season. This year he didn't have a target buck on the property, so we started immediately with bow season. We were up there trying to shoot cull bucks before the rut in, in October. But the year that you had Mel, it was – he's Stay only away. going in <laughs> it, – It's nothing else is happening until he gets that target buck down. Yep. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> this is John Yoder from Goshen, Indiana, and uh, I might have to have some of Terry's help here a little bit. But this is going to be a question for uh, Don uh, regarding mechanical broadheads and fixed blades. Um, you're saying that you would rather use a fixed broadhead versus a mechanical because the mechanical has more of a mechanical failure, whatever. Now, do you think the guys, this is just a question for you, I guess. Um, mechanical broadheads are for the guys that shoot better <laughs> versus the one that use a fix that might not sh shoot quite as well, or how, how does that work? Uh, the mechanicals are for a guy that has no discipline. He, when he sees a buck out there at 50 yards, he can't, he, uh, maybe he doesn't have the hunting skill to get that buck to 20 yards. So he has to take a pot shot as far as he can because he knows he's not a good enough hunter to get that buck at 20 yards. <laughs> I know Tony argued with this last <laughs> night and said, I'm a mechanical man. But did you all hear what he said about why? The amount of time that he spends to get that buck at complete broadside at a chip shot, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I, but how many hunters are doing that? No, they're going in there. The, the problem I have with it is, is he actually admitted the reason why we don't believe in it now, and I've said I'm a recovering mechanical guy. The time that people invest, they shortcut every single thing, and that's either where they put their tree stand or setting up their bow and shooting it. They think it's a shortcut, and it's a dangerous shortcut that's going to burn you. Well, it's not even a wise decision, no matter what range you're shooting at, because, uh, I mean, why do some western states not allow mechanical heads on game like elk? They don't penetrate. And uh, I'm just, if you, you, you heard it last night, if you was at the debate, if you shoot mechanicals, I respect your, your opinion and your choice. I, I've, I've let people hunt on my farm. They've sit right next to me in my blinds, shot mechanicals, and I never said a word to them. So even though my opinion is a, a very staunch and you're never, you're never changing my mind, I respect your opinion and if it's different. But if you do shoot a mechanical, it's not a matter of if that broadhead is going to fail you. It's a matter of when it's going to happen. You may shoot 10 deer, your next 10 deer, you blow right through them, you got a blood trail, a blind hippie could follow, and the deer falls over in 20 feet. I got but know. at some point, you're going to lose a deer because of that mechanical, and it's probably going to be a big buck. And I want you to remember Uncle Don told you. Maybe Jesus should be the only one that uses a mechanical broadhead because he's the only one that could ever make a perfect shot every shot. <laughs> I think Jesus is, <laughs> Jesus is smarter than that. Come on. <laughs> All right, who's got it? We got time for a couple more questions. That's it, and we're going to have to wrap up the show. Here we got go. One coming up here. Got a question? Make your way to the front. We only got a time for a couple more before we have to cut her off. Ray again, uh, how many uh, properties do you need to consult uh, for your clients before they get an invitation to your farm to shoot cold bucks? <laughs> this comes from a guy that's already had me out to look at uh, at least three. There, there was two that you own and a lease property. And I'm going back to your farm this week to look at at least, what, two, three more? Um, I'm glad you asked me that before two more. 
Yeah, and there's two of them. They're, they're, they're brothers. So, uh, wow, that means I got to find a place for two of you to hunt. That means you got to, you got to book me at least twice as many times. How about uh, 58? That's how old I am. <laughs> 58 properties, and I'm going to take you guys hunting. Fair enough? <laughs> and you guys have been to the master class, too. So, yeah. Maybe we should, we should work in a sponsorship for the podcast for you, the business. You guys don't know it, but I got a bank account <laughs> with your name on it. <laughs> All right. Let's hear your question. Yeah, I'm John Miller, Centerville, Michigan. Um, got a question on management. What's your buck to doe ratio that you keep it at? Is there such a thing as too many does on a property? I'm sure there is such a thing as too many does, but again, in my area, it just does not have a lot of deer, and I, I have never had to worry about the buck to doe ratio. Uh, there was at one point where we had uh, a, a, a lot more deer than we have today, and at that point, when, what I was trying to do was for every buck I, that got shot on my property, whether I shot it or somebody else shot it, I was trying to kill two does. So if we killed three bucks, I wanted to kill six does. And, and then the EHD outbreak hit in 2012 and just pretty much wiped our deer herd out. I mean, we had less than a quarter of what we had the year before. And, and the deer herd has never really fully recovered. So, uh, you know, today I, I don't worry about how many does I'm going to shoot. I don't worry about buck to doe ratio. My only thing is if I see a doe come by with twin buck fawns, she's getting a hammer. So. Gotcha. So my question is, okay, um, back when I first started with management four years ago, I was doing good if I was seeing three to six deer on the property. Mm -hmm. But during that year, I seen more 130 to 140 class bucks than I have ever seen since or before. Now I'm seeing up to 12 to 16, up to 20 deer every time I go out. And I have yet to see a 130 class deer uh, buck this past fall. What am I doing wrong? Well, I guess my first question is, are those deer still in your area? Are, you, are there still 130 inch bucks to the same level that they were when you started in your area? They were there the year before. But, but you don't know if they're still there? That I don't know. Uh, my guess is human intrusion. And the, the reason I say that is I've got more deer on my property than anybody in my entire township by a long shot. And most of those deer are does, fawns, and even young bucks. But I also have more mature bucks on my farm than anybody in my whole township. And the reason for it is the security that I provide. A mature buck, he wants the most secure place he can find to bed. And if that means he's got a bed by himself out in the middle of nowhere in one acre of cover in the middle of a uh, cornfield, that's where he'll bed. But it also means if, if his best option is a 100-acre woods that's just absolutely loaded with deer because no hunting's allowed there and nobody's in it, he'll, he'll take that choice too. So security is the, is the big thing. And in my opinion, something has happened on your property from when you started to now, that the mature bucks don't feel that that's the secure place to be. And uh, just to be honest, and to expand on that just a little bit, a lot of habitat projects do absolutely nothing to help you kill more deer, but they put human intrusion on your property. So in other words, if you may think it's, we talked about this in the debate last night, Water holes. Water holes are, are a good thing unless they're a water hole that's, you know, a little plastic tub or whatever that you got to go in continually and fill it up. Because every time you go in there, you're putting human intrusion in, in that area, and you're, you're, the mature bucks aren't going to put up with it. And the thing that a lot of deer hunters have trouble accepting is that a mature buck is a totally, he, he's almost a different species than the rest of the herd. His number one goal, period, is security. He wants security more than he wants a hot dough. Security is it. And after that, um, if you don't have security, you're not going to have them. Can I clarify something real quick? 
Did you notice how you asked your question and how he answered it? There was one thing that was completely different in the terminology. You asked your question based on the size of the rack and he answered it based on age. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that's what you implied, but for this whole room of people here, we get focused on what we're doing for the size of the rack and not understanding age structure. Those 120s, 130s, and 135s that you just mentioned might be five or six, seven years old. And until you understand age structure, and if your question is only about rack size, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get veered off really quick. You, you, you asked your question about size, pertaining to size of antler. He answered it in maturity and age. Gotcha. That animal acts different. So, you know, whether it's trail camera data, visual, you got to understand how old is that buck, not, not the size of the rack necessarily. Okay, Th thank you. Thank you for your question. All right. This is going to be a doozy. Hey, Aiden Miller, Northeastern Ohio. So after the debate last night, which I thought was great, uh, is there anything that you'd like to answer in a different way from how you answered it last night? Uh, you know, looking back, there's always things that you wish you'd have done different. If, um, I, I'm, I'm probably more critical of myself than, than anybody else. If I write a magazine article, it comes out in the magazine, I read it, and I'll think, why didn't I say this in that article? And, uh, you know, last night, the only thing that, that really stood out to me is I wish Tony plugged his class on his farm quite a bit. And I also offer, I call it a whitetail master course on my home farm. We also go look at a second property uh, a few miles away. I, I wish I'd have plugged that a little bit more so the audience would have realized that I also offer a class. But, you know, I can't complain. I've been extremely blessed. My classes are sold out every year. Um, I've got more consulting work than I can possibly handle. And uh, God's given me, a, you know, a just a boatload of blessings, and, and I'm sure not complaining. It was, it was a great uh, debate, and I'm extremely appreciative of everybody that showed up. So I, I'm happy with how it turned out. I appreciate your question, though. I'll stir the pot a little bit in that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I give my comment on it? Yeah. My, my thing that, and it's not saying I wish Don would have handled it differently, but just an observation, I think... And I don't, I don't want anybody to run to Tony's booth and say we accused him of something. But I thought that there was an implication that Tony was more for small properties, blue collar, low cost solutions. And Don is only going to put plans together for people with a couple hundred acres and a ton of money and a bunch of equipment. And that's, that's really far from the truth because most of the properties that you're working on and consulting on are small properties most of the farms that he hunts are small properties. Um, and I, I just, setting back, I could see that there was starting to get this divide in perception that Don's plan or his method only applies to if you have multiple hundreds of acres and a ton of money to afford to be able to do it that way. And, and that's not the case. But I, I don't remember this when I said I don't think Tony was trying to imply that of Don. It's just how the dialogue went with the questions. Well, uh, and one thing that uh, I did hit on a little bit, I probably should have hit a little bit harder, was the fact that, uh, you know, my top six bucks were killed on five different properties. So my method works basically on any property anywhere. Uh, Tony's bucks came pretty much from one property that he's, you know, put a lot of labor in. Uh, a lot of people don't have that that time to put into on a property like that and, and that's taken nothing away from Tony he's obviously did something fantastic on his property that a lot of us wish we could replicate but uh, the the fact that you know the success of my clients I have a fraction the number of clients that Tony has I, I'll bet you he has been to 10 times the properties I have over the years he's been doing it longer and he does more properties every year and, and yet I, I threw this example out um, in the debate, just in October last year, one month, I had three guys kill 200-inch bucks, two more kill 190s, and another one kill a 180. That's in the month, of, one month in October. Um, my method is proven. And not saying that Tony's is not, but I, I promise you, when I buy another property, and I'm going to, it's going to be set up with the same approach that I've set up my home farm and I didn't, it's been a learning process. I didn't just, 
you know, have a farm and, and instantly know what to do. I've made plenty of mistakes getting to where I'm at today, but today when I go to a property, I, I know from the mistakes I made on my own what to do. And uh, I probably should have hit that a little bit harder. But again, I, I'm extremely blessed and I'm not complaining whatsoever. All right. And this young man's coming back up. This is going to be the last question of the podcast. Uh, Parker Yoder, and when you're creating travel corridors, how close would you say too close is to like a building or a house? Well, that's a great question, Parker. You about stumped me there. Um, I, I guess it depends on the, the type of cover. The thicker the cover, the closer you can get to it a house or, you know, a populated area. And uh, the other thing is the, the dwelling itself. For example, I, I know a property, I, I can remember a property I hunted years ago that was owned by an elderly lady. The, the, the old lady never hardly got out of her house. And uh, I literally, believe it or not, I literally, I, I was still gun hunting at that time. That tells you how long ago it was. I was in my 20s. I literally ran a nice whitetail buck out of her barn. She had a barn with a sliding door on the back. It was all grown up in weeds and, you know, trees growing out of the foundation of the barn. And there was a draw that ran out. It was basically an old pasture ran out behind that barn, long and narrow, but it had grown up and hadn't been, had cattle or anything in it for years. And I was walking around the corner of that barn. I was going to walk out that draw with my shotgun, hopefully jump a buck and shoot him. Well, I walk around the corner of the barn, and out of that sliding door runs a white-tailed buck. Just startled the crap out of me because I wasn't expecting one to be there, and they ended up missing him. And believe it or not, I came back the next day, and that same buck was in that same barn, and I missed him again. Um, I came back the third day, and he wasn't there. <laughs> so uh, that, that's a story from way back. That, that story is at least 30 years old. So uh, thanks for your question, Parker. Appreciate it. You got any closing comments for us, young man? Nope. What's your favorite podcast? This one. Awesome. Right answer. All right. Well, we appreciate, um, we, we truly mean it. This, this community, this show is truly special to us. Uh, we have a lot of great friends that are here, and it's, it's just a, a great opportunity to see each of you. So we'll be in the booth for a little bit longer today, and uh, just thank everybody for their support. Uh, see you next week. God bless everyone. Chasing Giants has been brought to you by Osseo Camo, Bia Farm Real Estate Company, 360 Hunting Blinds, Victory Chevrolet, Real World Wildlife Products, Matthews Archery, Novix Tree Stands, Gingerich Tree Farm, WildlifeFarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode of Chasing Giants.